Hey, what's up? Ken from Palm Beach Dino here. Welcome to the latest episode of the Hit the Brakes podcast, where we sit down with industry leaders and racers and have some long conversations. The next guest you may know as the Godzilla expert all over YouTube, but did you know he was the director of global engine engineering for Ford, head of Ford Racing, father of the Cobra Jet, and an outlaw racer? Today, we sit down with Brian Wolf. Well, thanks for joining us, Brian. Uh, it's great to have you here at uh, Palm Beach Dino. Um, I chose you as one of my very first guests because I think uh, people need to know a lot about you. Everybody knows you as the 7.3 liter Godzilla guy that plays with Godzilla on the internet, and that's certainly true. Uh, but there's a big story that leads up to you doing that for everybody on YouTube with Evan, his channel. Uh, Revan Evan is his YouTube channel for people that want to check out Brian's content on uh on the 7.3 liter, it's awesome. Uh, you guys do great hands-on stuff, testing, and all that stuff, but I thought it would be great if we could sit down and just have a, a conversation about the history of Ford, Mustangs, and everything that led up to the 7.3 liter uh, Godzilla. So let's start off there really quickly. Um, what made you decide to take this on in the way you're doing with a company and all that? People don't, you know, you to some people you just popped up out of nowhere, but let's, why don't you tell us how you came upon the seven points? Well, yeah, well, sure. Well, first, thanks a lot for having me on. It's, it's really a pleasure to be, uh, be on your podcast. Uh, obviously, all the great stuff you guys do at Palm Beach Dino. Um, super, super impressive. But, yeah, the 7.3 kind of started. I retired from Ford after about 36 years at the end of 2017. And loved cars my entire life. And like I tell people, being retired and doing what I do is kind of like being 16 all over again, just with a little bit more money mm -hmm. to do some of the stuff I'd like to do. But uh, my last job at Ford was I uh, was the director of global engine engineering. So I had about 1,300 people that worked for me around the globe. So we were accountable for all the engines Ford did, whether it was the one liter Fox, which was a three cylinder, one liter engine, all the way up to the 6.7 diesel. Let me stop you right there. We'll kind of pick through this a little bit because that's an interesting thing to me. A lot of people uh, talk about different engines and different vehicles globally that are mm. available here but not there, you know, something that's available in Europe versus here. Um, so you were all of that, at the top of all of that? Absolutely, yeah. yeah. So, uh, you know, you had people, uh, a, a team in uh, Europe, team in Asia, team in South America, and of course, team in Dearborn. Okay. So, uh, yeah, it was, uh, it was, uh, I was very fortunate, uh, and I want to get to your question on the 7.3 and how yeah. that came about, but uh, I was, you know, like probably the luckiest guy in the world, you know, how many guys get to have two dream jobs at a major company? Yeah. So that was the position, if you will, I wanted at one point in my career when I first started Ford, I was just super tickled to be an engineer mm -hmm. and to work on engines. That was, you know, that to me, that was it. I didn't ever imagine going into management, but I was fortunate enough to run uh, Ford uh, Racing. So I had Ford, you know, what's known as Ford Performance today. So I yeah. had NASCAR, funny, all the racing, all the performance parts, all of that stuff at one point in time. And then um, I only, I was there for about 18 months and then went to transmission, ran trans, global transmission for Ford was in Europe and then came back and had this global engine engineering job, which is the one that I, you know, wanted from, I'd say 2002 when I first became a director. Uh, but when we were going through that, there was a need to replace the V10, mm -hmm. mainly on the dyno cert vehicle. So a dyno cert vehicle is one where it leaves Ford incomplete. So you can't do an emission test on the rolls because the vehicle's not complete. You don't know what the frontal area is. You don't know what the final vehicle is going to be like. Mm. So there is a process to certify those called dyno cert. And with the CO2 regulations coming up, that was what really drove it. So I'm kind of happy that we had CO2 regulations. So the V10 needed either a major upgrade or to be replaced. The V10 originally was a very cost-effective platform because it was a 5.4 with two more cylinders. So same valve, springs, pistons, rods. All that was you know, very uh, cost-effective for Ford. But as the 5.4 went away and that then all of a sudden became a very low-volume, high-cost engine. So to update that was going to be pretty expensive. Mm -hmm. So the original plan... Uh, was to take the 6.2 single red cam engine and make it a 
larger displacement to replace uh, the 68V10. And when I looked at that, it was a very, very expensive program because it was all new um, and expensive from the investment perspective because it was a new plant. So, you know, that's hundreds of millions of dollars to translate that. Mm -hmm. So I looked at it and I said, you know, I was never a, a big fan of the 6.2. Mm -hmm. uh, I liked the romantic part of it, like it was kind of like a, uh, a 427 single red cam architecture, but it was a really big engine and it had two spark plugs per cylinder and to be fully open in my opinion, it didn't have a lot to offer versus the competitive set. So the competitive set in the truck market was strictly, you know, the LS platform and the Hemi. So when we were, when it, the first prototype was already designed and parts were ordered and it came through me uh, for my, you know, for approval as we're taking it to the board for further approval. And I said, you know, I just don't know if this is the right architecture and you guys got to prove to me it's right. And to the credit of the engineers, because it was difficult for them, right? I remember all of our stuff was over at CAM at this point. Mm -hmm. I said, I, I just don't think so. So uh, the guys did a benchmarking and, you know, every company benchmarks. I don't, you know, if they tell you they don't, they're not being fully transparent with you. So uh, we were, you know, so I made them benchmark the other two competitive sets in the truck market, size, function, et cetera. And uh, they came back with, yeah, we can probably put cam in the block and we can make this thing a lot more compact. And as we make it more compact, we don't need um, all the complexity of different oil pans, different exhaust manifolds, different intake manifolds. One is gonna fit mm. where all, where we're gonna have three different variants uh, with the, uh, was a variant of the 6.2 is gonna be actually a 6.9 liter. Um, so, we took that forward. It was a late change uh, to the program. We had to cut program time out. And uh, the 73 was, if you will, born. Mm -hmm. And um, I knew it was gonna be a really good truck engine. And I, I suspected it would probably be good in the aftermarket because now you had something small enough to fit. The problem with the 62, I think why it didn't take off, it was so wide, mm -hmm. you know, kind of like the 427 back in the 60s. I mean, that was a big engine. I mean, it, it was hard to make it fit and stuff or like the Boss 429. So when we were going forward um, with it and I retired from Ford, um, I thought, you know, I'd like to kind of kickstart this in the aftermarket because I think this could really be um, a challenge to the LS. Now the Coyote, don't get me wrong, I love the Coyote. I think it's the best engine Ford ever made. And I would put it against a Ferrari, a Mercedes, any engine, because I tell people, how many engines do you make? No, naturally aspirated, make 100 horsepower per liter and the only maintenance is change oil every 10,000 miles. Right. You know, you look at a Ferrari, you gotta change timing belts, all of that stuff. So, um, uh, Coyote's great, mm -hmm. but like what I look at is like Ford fans have two really wonderful production engines in production today that they can choose from if they want to um, go into the performance area or do a swap in older vehicles. Yeah, yeah, I mean, that's, uh that's what drew me to it because obviously I'm a huge Coyote fan. Um, I've been tuning well before the Coyote. One thing you mentioned that was uh, interesting. Um, we were talking about the V10 being like a variant of the 5.4. I mean, that's pretty much what the whole modular term comes from, right? Where it's sharing parts and um, I'm assuming costs, you know, in uh, you know, in the lines and all that. Is that really like where that came from? That whole theory of the modular engine and everything being kind of similar? Yeah, you're spot on. As a matter of fact, I was part of what was known as a modular mafia at the time when, uh, you know, we were replacing the push rod engines. It's kind of ironic, right? Mm -hmm. Where I was part of the team that was replacing the push rod engines my last thing I took the board for approval was replacing over a cam engine with a push rod engine. Right. So kind of full circle, but you're right. There's a guy named Jim Clark, super smart guy, super intense. And he was, if you will, the architect uh, on the modulars. And that mm -hmm. was it. We're going to you know, take this and it was a four six to start with. And we did like a four liter variant at one mm -hmm. point to fit in the continental. And then we needed something to replace the truck engines, the 351s and you know, I remember them coming to me, well, can we make it any bigger? And I said, well, it's a hundred millimeter bore spacing and with the rod ratio, and the only way to make it bigger is to, you know, raise the deck height and make the stroke longer, or, uh, you know, we have to change the bore spacing, which is then changes the architecture when you change that bore spacing. Mm -hmm. So yeah, that's, that's the way it started. And then from there, you know, well, how do we get more displacement than five fours? Well, we added two mm -hmm. cylinders. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> 
so you know circling back to the coyote verse seven three um it's funny that you said that where people you were part of the modular mafia mm-hmm. and then the push rod thing uh from a tuning perspective or like what i talk about uh you know i ran into that a little bit everybody was like you you know you were the modular guy i mean i when i started in this business 20 years ago my website was called modular depot um and i was like you know no push rods you know anti push rods mm-hmm. raced enema array and it was in pure street it was the push rods versus the super slow modulars that were mm-hmm. slowly getting quicker and quicker and we were like you know not even taken seriously uh and now now all of a sudden you know i've got my super duty and the and the seven three and i've been pushing that and um a lot of people ask me like you know why why are you doing that like what coyote 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 and i'm like i get that but you know there's not one solution for everybody uh and the potential i saw in the seven three over the coyote um is for the swap market because there's so many people putting a coyote into an older like street rod or you know which i'm not really part of that we tune a lot of those i don't know a lot about that but say like a 32 ford or anything Mm -hmm. for me i'd much rather have a push rod engine that sounds like your car or my truck than Mm -hmm. a coyote in it from a you know just a a experience of just Mm -hmm. driving the vehicle and add on top of that it makes great power it's awesome architecture I saw the potential immediately and a lot of people didn't quite understand that. And then as soon as, you know, you immediately came out with all this stuff uh, and got everybody's attention. And uh, I think that was really critical. Um, In our last podcast, we spoke about Jerry, uh, we spoke to Jerry and um, he was talking, we were talking about there being like one particular person that's Mm -hmm. responsible for the Mm -hmm. branches of how things go. And, uh, you know, you play a double part there because mm-hmm. not only are you responsible for the engine existing from a uh, management perspective, mm-hmm. but then you immediately pivoted to promoting it in the aftermarket. And <clears throat> I just wanted to really state that because, I mean, has that ever happened in the world? Like where, you know, a performance <laughs> engine or a yeah. engine is released in the OEM and the guy who's really kind of responsible for that happening, not that you design every little mm-hmm. bit of it, but you mm-hmm. were the mastermind and mm-hmm. he d- just suggesting that it even happened. Then to retire and take up all that work to promote mm-hmm. it, you know, if you didn't do that, would we be talking about a 7.3 right now? It'd just be like, oh, that's a truck engine. Or maybe we would. You yeah. know, so I, you know, I appreciate yeah. you doing that. And, uh, you know, and that, that really brings in another big part of your background that we'll touch on a little bit later, uh, but your racing background, that's mm-hmm. another level to this. That's truly phenomenal, right? Mm-hmm. Like how many executives at Ford uh, race outlaw Mustangs? You could yeah. probably answer that. Yeah. Well, not, not many. <laughs> not yeah. many. Yeah. Not, yeah. not many. Yeah. yeah. You know, so, you know, I, I, we, we, we are fairly new as far as being friends. Mm-hmm. Um, but before we were friends, if somebody on Facebook said, name the top 10 influential guys mm-hmm. in the early days of Mustangs, mm-hmm. your name was mentioned because you were not necessarily because you were an engineer. It's mm-hmm. because you were actually out there racing these vehicles. Um, mm-hmm. So why don't we talk about that a little bit real quick to pivot to to the race car deal Um, or even really your beginnings in this whole hobby is really Mm -hmm. kind of what's interesting to me for everybody. Um, Did you always see yourself on the path to to something along these lines? Like when I'm talking like, you know, junior high, high school days or did this kind of develop over time no yeah i always loved cars since i was as they say knee high to a grasshopper right and you know my dad was a big ford guy my brother raced a 427 fair lane the super stocker in the 60s and uh, uh real quick were you guys did you grow up in in the in michigan in, yes uh, yeah grew yeah. up uh in uh, on the east side so yeah. more gm country that's where right. the tech center is but right. my dad was always a big ford guy okay and uh you know my brother as well so you know, when I remember, that, you know, it's funny, there's so much I forget, right? And, you know, I'm, at my age, I mean, I forget a lot. And there's a few th- little things you remember. I remember my brother starting up that 427 Fairlane at home in St. Clair Shores. Uh, and I was probably 
is a 66 Fairlane. I was probably eight years old, and he fired. I got to sit in the passenger seat when he started up, you know, big grin on my face. And, you know, like I say from there, I was hooked, right? So I always, you know, really enjoyed it. I bought my first car when I was 15, somewhere before I turned 16. I still own that. It's a 1969 Fairlane Cobra, 420 Cobra Jet. Wow, that's awesome. And uh, so I raced that a bit. And the best that car ran was like, um, I think 1290, the way I had it. So, I mean, it wasn't overly built, you know. Um, and then when I started to, to race the five liter Mustang, uh, it was, you know, kind of like the GT40 parts, right? So it had like the B303 cam and a GT40 cast iron head and the GT40 intake and headers. And this is like what time period? 89. 89. 89. 89. I, was, I was way off. I was going to say mid 90s. <laughs> yeah, 89. And the first wow. time I took it out, it went like 1257. Wow. And I remember saying, wow, that was way too easy. Mm -hmm. And that's what really got me hooked on the five liter stuff. And back then, uh, it was an 86 Mustang and a lot of guys were pulling the fuel injection off and putting carburetors on. I said, well, I really was never real good with carburetors and being an engineer, I kind of liked the fuel injection. So that ended up being the first, you know, Fox body, five liter fuel injected Mustang naturally aspirated around 11s, 10s and 9s in the quarter mile. And that was really cool going through that. And we did a dabbled in Pro 5 a little bit. Um, and then in around 92, I kind of backed away because work was getting pretty intense. And guys like Joe De Silva and Donnie Walsh and uh, Jimmy LaRocca and, you know, Race and Jason Storm and Norman, all those guys were still, you know, you know, working hard and progressing, going faster and faster and faster. Um, and then I came back into things a little bit later. But, uh, yeah, that was always a, a really uh, good time. And then as far as, you know, the types of vehicles you raced over the years, um, you did, didn't you do a lot of the NA stuff at, at one point? Oh, I did a lot. Yeah, then, the, yeah. Like that 10.5 NA? Yeah, thing. what I did is Milan Dragway, which is only six miles from my house, um, they had a class very similar to NMCA uh, NA 10.5. So it was, the rules were a little different. And I started with a small block. This was like in 2012 when I started to come back into it. So it was a, uh, a stroke small block. It was like 470 cubic inch Windsor type. Uh, no, it wasn't. It was a Windsor deck height, but a Cleveland type head on it. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, we raced that. That went, I think, the best, quickest I went with that. NA was an 816 uh, at like 168 miles an hour. It was competitive. I won my first race uh, in that car. And Chris Holbrook was building my engines at the time, being at Ford. I mean, that was a 12 to 14 hour day job. I did not have time to build engines. Mm -hmm. And Chris, super good with, you know, Fords and engines. Yeah, and he was sure. my, you know, the engine builder. He said, Brian, if you really want to be competitive and win a championship, you probably need to go to a big block in that class. So we did, uh, we built a, uh, uh, you know, big, big block Hemi, uh, 695 cubic inch, Dave Zimmerman, built the chassis, it was a new edge Mustang, beautiful car. Uh, and you know, Jason Lee from day one was tuning it. Not that I didn't know how to tune, but I didn't know how to tune like Jason tuned, right? right. And having somebody as him and Patrick Barnhill both as good and efficient as they were, like the first day out in the car, I remember this like yesterday, it was a, I did a track rental at Milan and then I remember the Toronto was up and, you know, we got, we we're getting things sorted on it. And I said, okay, well, we'll come back, you know, tomorrow and do it. And Patrick goes and goes, hey, bitch, we're here. You're going to mm -hmm. pay the same if we stay the next four hours or if we leave and come and you're going to pay us again if we have to come back tomorrow. Let's just get this done. And that first day out in the car, you know, one, I didn't hurt it. Mm -hmm. Right. <laughs> and two, it went like 788, which was I think quicker than the record in the class was at the time. Mm -hmm. And again, the value of having somebody that as good as they were tuning that car uh, from day one. And then since then, um, you know, people say, why don't you do your own tuning? I say, it takes so much pressure off when you're in the driver's seat, you're worried about the engine, you're worried about the mechanical to know that the guy at the keyboard or the guy opening the door after I do the burnout, changing the tune because the track changed is covered. There's mm -hmm. not going to be a mistake there. And uh, that is super, super well, valuable. Th that's a super interesting uh Thing to bring up because here you are with your background mm. is, you know you have one of the best backgrounds to be able to do this by yourself than mm. anybody build the engine tune mm. the car there's people that do that you know i think billy glidden was probably well known for that right. like he did everything himself mm. but 
there's a value in having people around you uh, mm. to as a team, right? Yep. And that's that's what you did because you had Holbrook building the engine, you had uh, Jason and Patrick tuning the car. Even though you're completely capable of that, I would assume you feel like you were more successful by making those decisions because you're not trying to do everything yourself. Yeah, no, there is no doubt, and I, right. I give tribute that to time at Ford, right? Mm -hmm. Because you know I was. Uh, uh, you know, uh, an executive for quite a while, right? Mm -hmm. And I remember I be first became a supervisor. The one question that I was asked that sticks in my mind is he goes, up to this point in your career, you were judged on what you can accomplish yourself, what you did, how you did it. Um, going forward, if you get this supervisory job, you're going to be judged on your team's performance. Mm -hmm. How do you feel about that? And, uh, and that was kind of the light going off is that, you know, to, to be successful, you need people around you that want to be successful and, you know, pick them and stick with them, right? Mm -hmm. You know, be wise on how you pick and, and, and do that going forward. So, you know, not only did I do that at Ford, but also, you know, in, in the racing as well. And with that car, uh, you know, we won the championship the following, you know, we, we debuted the car in 14 and won the championship in 15, 16, and 17. And then uh, we, I sold the car, and we uh, started to do the. Uh, that's when we did the uh, uh, X two seventy five car. That then I switched over to a Godzilla uh, uh, platform. And that's an interesting place to go now. So now you're racing the Godzilla engine that you're designing. What, what's the life cycle of something like that? So, you know, what it debuted in 2020? In the 2020. 20? So when when did you guys have a running version of that engine? Uh, let's see. Probably 2016. Yeah. So that's a lot, pretty long. And that, yeah. that's when it was running. Yeah. You had a running version. So, First running. And then obviously. But it was super, super. Um, again, because it was a 2020 model year, but then you got to back up um, probably production, first production engine, pre-production engine that rolled off the plant would have been in early 2019, mm -hmm. you know? And then, uh, so you think about that's like kind of 24 months from first engine run to per, until you got the whole thing tooled. And what, what, how much time preceded that from the, when you guys said we're doing this to yeah. having that running engine? Well, we... Well, I came back from Europe in 15, at the end of 15, and I probably didn't even review that program till sometime in 16, because again, right. you're worried about everything going through, right? And then they already had the first prototypes ordered, they're coming. So I think we probably made that change in late 16. So it was probably, I mean, they, all, they didn't, and that was the thing, right? So again, you gotta let your team do their job, because as soon as you try to I mean, I could talk about the architecture and is this the right thing and say, I want to see the benchmark. I want to make sure this is the right thing. We've got to, you know, and, and go through that. But I wasn't the guy designing the ports or mm. dictating the valve angle or any of that, right? Or, um, you know, but when things came forward, uh, because you recognize these guys are in a tight time frame, if I start meddling with, you know, minute details of it, mm. you know, they're just going to back off and say, well, okay, well, wait till he we, he does what we tell us to do, right? Right. And that's not good. That's not how you, you get people motivated. Uh, so, you know, you just, um, you know, there were things I probably would have changed a little bit. Mm. But um, I think the one thing I made him change was the damper was going to be like 25 pounds. Mm -hmm. And I said, you know, yeah. Yeah, show me another one that, that, that's heavy. Um, so they, they had to do a little bit of rework there. But um, most of it was, you know, as, as a team design. So it wasn't that long, probably from the time I asked him to start the benchmark to we probably had the first engine running was probably like nine months. Wow, and then, that's amazing. And then when we, um, you know, did it, I remember going forward uh, to my boss, who's the vice president of powertrain, and, you know, I told him what we we're doing. He said, okay, you know, I guess the outcome's in. We went in with the manufacturing guys, and they wanted another X millions of dollars to make the change, right? Mm -hmm. So I won't go through the specifics, but it was, you know, millions of dollars. And at that point in time in Ford, a lot of programs were going forward, like new vehicle programs, new vehicle programs on the whole scale of billions of dollars. And the guys come back in and say, well, I need another 40 million. You know, they say, get out of here. You know, right. you got this much money figured out. So he said, look, I'm not, so we were in there with the manufacturing team and we're going forward. And Bob said, look, I like everything here, but I'm not going to go forward and ask for any more money. We're not going to get it. So we get out of that meeting. And this was another trick I got from Jim Clark. 
the guy manufacturing guys, well, Bob's really not behind it. He doesn't want to do this. Well, I guess we're just going to fold the cards. I said, no, Bob wants this really bad. He just can't go forward. We got to figure out how to get this, you know, get this extra investment out. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and, you know, tr- again, trying to get my counterpart, same level as I was, motivated in manufacturing, to get his team motivated to figure out how we're going to make this thing at least investment neutral. Mm-hmm. And then by the end of the day, we took a significant amount out of the investment of the original program approval, mm. significant, like probably 25% out and several hundred dollars out of the variable cost too. Mm. So uh, everybody was pretty happy at the end of the day. But again, you had to know when to push, when to back away, mm-hmm. and you'll kind of read the cards to, to get things to happen. I, I think, uh, at least I'm very interested in, hopefully everybody else is, uh, a little bit, more detail on like this process, right? So now you've got this design on paper for a seven three. Obviously, like how, how does how how does the the first engines get built? Like, are they? Do you make a CNC head first, or, or like do they go in, directly to a casting? Like, how how, do, how does that pro? Like, how different is it from when they designed it? like mm. through the process are a lot of changes made you know obviously you just don't pop out a block in a production head so is there right. some intermediate yeah so the block itself um you know first see while they all were cast mm. right because you know the cast water you know because you gotta get the water jackets in there and mm. all that cooling correctly um and you know ford's scenes are uh, um cad is ext- or a computer engineering those computational fluid dynamics is very very good in fact ford does not even have a flow bench anymore wow so it's all computer so the so they were very very good and of course i respected that process so first answer to your direct question they were all cast cast you know rapid cast mm-hmm. you know, parts and you're paying you know expedite expedited tooling to get those things done but one of the things you know being a racer respecting the engineers, respecting the tool set, but also knowing the aftermarket is very good too. So I said, you know, as we only have one chance at this, um, I want to go and get some input on the cylinder head design from the outside uh, performance part. So uh, we had Roush Yates uh, look at it. We had Roush Livonia look at it, two different engineering teams. One was Mm -hmm. their race team. One was, you know, the guys that do more production related stuff. And then we also had uh, Dave Visner, uh, look at it as well who's in grand rapids and you know they all came back and they said well with the constraints we have because you need a lot of cooling in that head mm-hmm. especially around the plug and the valves because if you tow a you know twenty eight thousand pound trailer up davis dam mm-hmm. you know you're at wide open power for a long period of time and you need to get the heat out so there's a lot of water in it and the head that was a design requirement so he said well, we really can't you know um you know, offer suggestions for improvement on the port. So again, validating. Mm. So again, I wasn't accusing. It was like, I want to get validation because we won't have a second chance of prototypes because mm. we lost our first prototype series because of the change from overhead cam to cam and block. But uh, Dave Visner came up with, he goes, you know, he goes, why did you guys point the spark plug at the intake valve and kind of the exhaust valve like convention? And, you know, just in a very innocent way, you know, I asked the question and to the team's credit you know again no one got defensive everyone looked he said you know and they were doing the fluid dynamics why the design was being reviewed and uh he said wow we go you know as we open the valve we the injector was going to spray right at the spark plug which would have been a disaster right so they quickly changed spark plug angle to you know be conventional and aim towards the exhaust port and um you know if you will the rest is history right but right. again the value of because if we would have waited for that first prototypes or the prototypes we would have been in deep deep because it would have had all kinds of problems oh, well see that's problems. a super interesting thing to maybe because you know we're talking about uh you know what can change through the process and to me that would be the last thing that mm-hmm. i would think about you know mm-hmm. where this i would think about the port and mm-hmm. you know what you know what cam how the valve train is going to work but just something as simple as that mm. uh it's interesting that something like that could get a little bit overlooked i guess i would say yeah. you know uh, i i believe the reason it was i believe the guys were thinking well in the future cycle upgrades we're probably going to want to direct inject this uh, okay and that would have been the right conventional for direct injection but 
you know, I was very adamant on keeping the engine as simple as possible because, like, I remind people, I said, yes, the engine is bigger displacement-wise than the competitive set, but I get this same or better fuel economy in the truck. I don't have variable displacement. I don't have direct injection. I don't have all those complexities of things that can go wrong at high mileage. Right. So the team did this with, I'd call it the old-fashioned way, with, you know, compression ratio or expansion ratio, because that's where you get the, the, the work is not compressing the charge, but expanding the charge mm -hmm. when you're burning it. And so it was, you know, 10 and a half to one, but it runs on, it's a big bore, 4.22. But um, with the cam timing that was selected in the, in, you know, it does have dual equal VCT, you know, you close that exhaust valve late, so you are less detonation prone, so you still get the advantage of the expansion ratio and the work, mm. but you don't have the, you know, quite as octane tolerance, and the engine is extremely fast burn. Like, it only wants uh, NA about 23 degrees of spark mm. max at wide open throttle. So I had nothing to do with that, right? That was the team that designed those features into it. So it's a very, very simple engine, and I wasn't, you know, I was okay with moving that plug because I, I had no intention over the life cycle of making direct injection. Just, you know, it's very expensive. Yeah, and, you know, for you to pick this as a, a, as a race engine and what well, you mentioned, you consulted race-level <laughs> people. people for a truck engine. Is that because of your background or is that, would that be typical? Like, that doesn't seem typical to me. I no. don't see GM going to... You know, it's, it's, racers to say, "Hey, how does our head look?" You know, that's that's awesome. Yeah, it, no, it's not typical. Um, I'd say it's probably more from you know my background in knowing and respecting what these people could do and their insight, right? Because mm -hmm. you know, um, again, the engineering team is super strong, super good. Um, but again, when you're on a when you can't afford a mistake, mm -hmm. the more input and feedback you can get is is good. And you know, to me those were extremely good people to ask the question to. So, uh, you know, you want to get, again, you want to get the input from the best, right? You're only as good as the people that you surround yourself with and help you to accomplish your goals. Yeah, you know, and what really impresses me about that whole process is uh, comparing it to other times. And I don't, I'm not going to give a specific example, but when you come up with a product and you go, what were they thinking? Why didn't they talk, like, did they not talk to somebody about this? Or, you know, you, uh, I'm not an engineer, you are. This isn't negative towards engineers, but sometimes when you're not an engineer, you go, did they get lost in the math and not really actually think of, like, practical examples of this? And I think that's where you bridge the gap because you're not just doing it from an engineering perspective. You're out there actually racing these things and understand it uh obviously not everybody who buys a super duty or very small people are going to go race the super duty but the engine in general if it can succeed in a race environment it's probably going to succeed everywhere right because the architecture is solid so and i'm not a push rod guy at all mm -hmm. but i know there's some advantages to this engine over like a the competitors like isn't the camshaft uh bearing much larger than like what you would have the journals like in like say the gm equivalent things like that like where people would upgrade that the, the 73 is already that way right no you're, you're you're right so i remember um going to uh the camshaft engineer and saying hey you know because again i you know i was thinking they may even be as like a 50 millimeter kind of conventional and i was going to push them to make it bigger so cam stiffer go hey uh What's, what's cam bearing size? Looks at me and smiles, goes, 60 millimeter. I go, that's good, good mm -hmm. job. You know, and that was, that was you know, the discussion. The one thing um, that we do get criticism for is, uh, that I've seen on the internet, is the lifter bore diameter is 842, which is the same as a Gen 3 Hemi and the LS. And it was kind of the same thing, is that if the guys would, you know, because again, my question is, you know, on the benchmark, you know, why do we need these unique things? Because again, tight timeline, we buy, they always buy from very, you know, from the same supply base, right? So if they would have wanted, you know, an 892 or a 912 lifter, we would, why do we need something unique? Because I know that's going to be unique tooling, unique cost, unique in the field. Um, so, you know, the camshaft is unique, right? We, mm -hmm. we machine it, uh, you know, at Ford, but lifters were buying from the same guy the other guys are buying from. 
So, uh, you know, that would have been something that I wouldn't have, you know, wanted to happen without proof that we're actually getting, you know, show me the performance I'm getting it, show me the fuel economy I'm getting for it. Mm. And then, you know, we would, uh, you know, have that discussion. Mm. But um, so, uh, yeah, to answer your question, um, the, you know, looking at the cam design and other aspects of the engine, you know, the, the rod ratio, the bore spacing, um, you know, you want to look at the competitive set, but then if you're going to be unique, you got to understand what you're getting for it. Yeah. And, you know, I've run into that myself, uh, designing much, much simpler things where I have, you know, a vision in my head of how it's going to turn out. But then when it comes to actually manufacturing it and what's available and how difficult that's going to be to pull off, that's where the rubber meets the road, right? Uh, no matter what you're, you're manufacturing, you can, man, uh, you can design something that's perfect, but if it's difficult to service or manufacture or any of those things, yes, the final product might be great, but over the life of the product, it might not be because there's just a lot of pitfalls to getting to that point, whether it be cost or serviceability down the road. So those are all the things, like mm -hmm. you pretty much said, that go, go into the decisions here. And people don't always understand that. They'll look mm -hmm. at that engine and go, man, this is great. This is great. But why the heck did they do that? Or why did they do this? And it's like, no product is perfect, right? Great. There's always constraints, time, money, uh, requirements. You know, you may mm -hmm. have wanted mm -hmm. certain things like the camshaft. Mm -hmm. Maybe that the, the guy who designed the camshaft was already on the same page as you. Mm -hmm. But if he hadn't been, maybe you would have had a campaign for that or show right. a re like, let's do it this way. And speaking of that, so mm -hmm. your background running the whole thing is at, at a racer, but I think I don't know many uh, engineers that work at that level. Like the guy mm. that designs camshafts at Ford, mm. or the guy that does the cylinder head port design. Are what what type of background do those people have? Obviously, they're mm. engineers, but I'm assuming most of them aren't really hardcore car guys. I mean, are they or aren't they? I don't know. No, there's there, there, there's <laughs> there, there are, there's very few, yeah. right? But um, like the guy that designed it was a hill cylinder head guy, a guy named Tim Taylor. Mm -hmm. um, he did a fantastic job. You know, he's a, he's a very, you know, introvert, very polite, very professional. And I, I don't think he was a big car enthusiast, but his goal was to do, you know, is to be a super good cylinder head engineer, right? Right. And that was what was important to him, and he, and he, and he is. Um, likewise, the guy that designed the ports on the um, Coyote, a mm -hmm. uh, guy named John Rich. Now, he kind of was a little bit more of a performance enthusiast, but um, he was, uh, you know, not... He wasn't a racer, but again, he was just, but he was very good at, with the CFD tools and again, wanting to be the best that he could be. So, uh, then we got another guy, uh, that's still Ford, Adam Christian, who is a, you know, he's what I wish I was, right? I mean, he can, he's super good analytically. I mean, he, he, uh, the, the computational fuel fluid dynamics, he, he knows, uh, the tools that we use for engine simulation, he spearheaded and kind of resurrected those from kind of a, um, stagnant place mm -hmm. to taking them to like two levels beyond but as an example what adam can do so when nascar was maybe a little bit behind with the ford guys he you know did this engine simulation on the ford tools of the nascar engine and came up with the header design now that he come up with the header design on cad he made them in his garage and sent them to the race team to test wow you know, so uh, he worked uh, with a guy named Moe Nolan, who was a super famous, uh, recently passed away, Ford engineer that raced, uh, that was in Le Mans. He was pretty much on every per Ford performance engine from the 60s and retired out of Ford performance. Uh, his last program was the pro stock engine that mm -hmm. was done uh, when I was there. Um, but Adam, you know, worked with him on restoring the Ford GT that's in the Henry Ford Museum. Super, super talented guy, super smart analytically, you know, just uh, so there's a guy that I would say is way beyond what I, you know, ever accomplished, you know, from a well, uh, maybe a, a, in a focused area. But what makes you <laughs> valuable in my eyes is your diversity. Mm -hmm. You know, you're dealing yeah. with both ends of the spectrum, like a guy yeah. like that who would, you mm -hmm. know, like you said, introverted type of personality uh, mm -hmm. that is just so laser focused on one thing. Yeah. And they're so valuable to us yeah. uh, because of their, their brain power. Yeah. But, 
and without, motivation and motivation, but without, you know, other people to take their, what mm. their small part and put it into a bigger picture, mm. you know, uh, that's just as important, like somebody like yourself. Um, so when, during the life cycle of some, or the, the planning of something like this, like mm -hmm. when, when it started, right? Don't, we have a 6.8 very, I'm a little behind the, mm -hmm. you know, right. the learning curve on, on that. I, I don't know much mm -hmm. about the 6.8, everybody talked about it. Why don't we talk about that really quick? Is that just like a smaller version of the 7.3? Right, and that uh, was just kind of being chatted about a little bit when I retired. Mm -hmm. So uh, basically, you know, the 6.2 is going away. Mm -hmm. And they're replacing it with the six eight, and that's a you know a, a an entry level version of the seven three. So I believe it's I believe I could be wrong. I thought I read somewhere it's going to be a cast crank instead of a forge crank. Mm. So um, I think a couple other things that are going to make it more cost effective to be more of an entry level engine. But I believe the block, the cylinder heads good parts like that are, are going to be the same. Yeah. Well, you know, we kind of glossed over the whole Ford crank, even in the seven three, um, is that typical of like a truck engine or is that the what now? The Ford crank in the seven three? Uh, well, you know, I attribute this, I, I wanted to mention this earlier too, about the, uh, the cam stuff, yeah. but Ford's got, uh, and I'm sure all companies do very rigid design guides, right. Mm -hmm. On what they need. Uh, from either a strength or reliability. So I attribute like the 60 millimeter cam bearing before I asked and the investment cast um, rocker arms that are super stiff is we did so many overhead cam engines, you know, there was a design criteria for valve train stiffness deflection. So uh -huh. it didn't matter to the engineer if it was a push rod or an overhead cam, they needed to meet those criteria. Mm -hmm. And by the way, you know, it's not the only push rod engine we have because the 6.7 diesel is also a push rod engine. Yeah. Okay, so, <laughs> so the Super Duties have all push rods. But same thing with the, with the crank, with the horsepower it's making and the, and the durability that that needed mm -hmm. and crankshaft bending, you know, it demanded a forged crank. Yeah. yeah, so basically when you were there doing the 7.3, you're not even, like the 6.8's not even no, like they don't plan that way ahead. Like we're going to have this and then we're going to have a six, eight version of it. That's kind of like just that came, that came evolution. along after, an evolution. Yeah. In uh, fact, you know, when I was there at one point, you know, we were discussing, um, and again, it was more around the w water cooler as opposed mm -hmm. to in any official, you know, thing, but we're saying, Hey, does it make sense to do a, a variant of this that fits in the mm -hmm. F one fifty or replace the coyote, which would like, I, I, I don't know, you know, because, you know, if we take the F1, if we take the Coyote out of the F-150, now this yeah. was, oh man, the vibe's going to be really low for the Mustang. Well, you know, and uh, I, you know, I, I wasn't like over, you know, enjoyed with that as an option sure. because it was, you know, already in there. But they said, hey, if we did, you know, an aluminum block and it's going to be a lot less expensive and, you know, same mm -hmm. thing with the uh, late intake valve closing and get the fuel economy, you know, is that something that made sense? But again, that was more of a chat around the water cooler. So same thing. Um, with the six eight, it was just something that, you know, is is there going to be you know uh, an appetite in the future to, um, you know, replace the six two? But it was nothing serious at that time. So being you know involved in all the engines, this question has come up, and people have asked me that this, and I don't know. So you take the seven three, and you want to make a lower cost alternative, like mm -hmm. where obviously you mentioned the crank being cheaper because it's mm -hmm. cast. But like, why make it like why ma making it smaller? Like, wh why wouldn't you just put the seven three with the cast crank and something? Yeah, uh, big big reason would be fuel economy, right? So okay. again, you know that that's uh, CO two drives an enormous amount of what we do for, do for the good and sometimes for the not as good. Mm -hmm. Like one of the things I was un unsuccessful in was I did not want to do a variable displacement Coyote in the F one fifty. Right. But, you know, it was like, well, you know, we booked the fuel economy for it. And, you know, what's your answer if you take it out? You know, and we couldn't come up with something that would offset that. But, uh, um, you know, that was so, you know, you didn't always get your way just because you were the guy that ran the organization. You right, know, right. Because there were other interfacing groups that you had to, uh, you know, deliver to. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we're talking about the new 7.3 and, you know, different variants and possibly the Coyote, you know, is in danger in the F-150. It wasn't. Let's fast forward a little bit. Mm -hmm. What do you think about the whole electric thing? 
You know, what's yeah. your opinion on that? Uh, my, my opinion on electric vehicles, uh, interesting, right? So um, electric vehicles, I think, have a, have a place. I believe that the environmental impact is oversold, in mm-hmm. my opinion. I think it's more about wealth shift than about the environment, in my humble opinion. Mm-hmm. Right? That's not anybody's opinion but my own. I don't want to you know, reflect on Ford or, or anything in that regards. But um, where I think electric vehicles might have, I think, a really like a good purpose is, you know, when you get to these large cities, Paris, L.A., New York, London, where you have vehicles idling for long periods of time and a lot of people walking on the street. There's, you know, studies that say hydrocarbons and NOx emissions are carcinogenic and bad for, you know, lungs, right? So when I was in Europe, one of the studies that was done by the government was as we as they tighten the emission standards from, you know, X to Y to Z, they saw, hey, these levels were coming down, but then all of a sudden they plateaued off. Even though the certification standards were tougher, they really weren't necessarily seeing that in, you know, in the city. So, you know, my view is that if you want to have a, the biggest impact quickly on health, and again, I haven't done a deep dive into the impact on the respiratory system of NOx and hydrocarbons. So I'm going to take that at face value that it's true. Mm-hmm. I don't know it's true, but mm-hmm. let's assume it's true for argument's sake. So you could, to me, I say you could draw a ring around London, Paris, Shanghai, LA, New York, and say, if you're within this circle where there's a lot of people walking and a lot of congestion, only electric vehicles. Mm-hmm. And if that, if there is truth to this has you know, a respiratory impact, um, then that would have a big, a big help. Now, if I'm driving out you know, in the panhandle of Florida, or if I'm driving you know, out in Willis, Michigan, mm. it doesn't make a difference. All right. You know, because those are what they call, NOx and hydrocarbons are local gases. They kind of come out of the tailpipe and they mm. disseminate to the ground where CO2 goes in the atmosphere and CO2 that's created in, you know, let's say Canada by the forest fires ends mm. up over Shanghai someday because right. it goes up in the atmosphere. So CO2 is a global gas, NOx hydrocarbons are local gases. So, um, you know, I, I think that it's a bit oversold. I don't know if they've, talked about enough about the total impact on the environment and humanity Mm -hmm. uh, for an electric conversion. I mean, there's almost, when I was at Ford, I think the global vehicle sales a year were globally, Mm -hmm. you know, was like not Ford, but total market. It was like, I think 90 to 100 million vehicles annually. You're going to make all those electric? Really? You know? Yeah. And that's, that's how I see it. It's it, it, in theory, you know, looking at the data that I don't even know is 100% true, it seems okay, but the scalability is the problem, right? Mm. Scaling electric to that level, mm. and like you said, the impact, we have no idea, you know? Mm. Um, so the only benefit I see to it short term, which, you know, there's all these, you know, a lot of these manufacturers are saying they're getting rid of gasoline vehicles, which to me mm. seems way premature at this point, and almost impossible to pull off. I do see a value in the small cities or the big cities and small trips and public Mm. transportation and maybe autonomous vehicles that Mm. can pace each other and everything's at slower speeds in the big cities anyway. It's not like you're Mm. going across New York City at 80 miles an hour. So I see the benefit there, but I just, I, I don't understand the, how extreme this push is or how it could be that way. And, uh, you know, you can, where we can really go off uh, into another direction and talk mm. about you know the politics of mm. it and the economy of it mm. and who's going to get rich because of it and all those sorts of things and I do think that's a major influence, but I'm still shocked with how quickly it seems to be accelerating. Yeah, in a way that like it doesn't seem like it's actually going to be able to happen that way. Even if they want it to happen that way, it just it just doesn't seem like it can. Yeah, and again, you know, without, you know, just talking facts, right? Yeah. So the way I look at it, and again, not being political, just looking at what's happened over time. Um, to me, I said Chrysler couldn't, couldn't spell electric vehicle during the last administration, right? They never talked about it. Mm-hmm. New administration comes in, very tough regulations come out. 
that were not debatable. Normally, when there's new regulations, they present it to the auto companies, they get feedback, they go back and forth negotiation. These count very tough. So that's like you may remember Chrysler saying, well, we can't meet the new regulations with the Hemis, mm -hmm. right? And so that came out that that quick. And then, of course, they very quickly, you know, looked at electric vehicles. Um, you know, there's other answers too, like hydrogen. But again, this is where I say it's about wealth, wealth shift more than the environment because hydrogen vehicles, there's a guy named Mike Copeland that's done a lot of work on that. You, Toyota's announced a bunch of work on that as well where, you know, water comes out tailpipe, you know? Mm -hmm. So, um, but again, it's not in line with the marching orders. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I mean, if you're an open-minded person just analytically looking at facts, you, you got to scratch your head, right? And say, is there more to it than this? But I think, like you said, for uh, you just kind of got to leave that where it is because, uh, you know, when I talk about cars and cool stuff as opposed to politics, right? Yeah, for sure, for sure. It's just uh, the thing that bothers me the most is seeing these electric dragsters. Like, I, to me, it's just soulless. Like, it's just not that exciting to me. And I don't think, I, again, I can share it with you. Like, uh, Nancy, uh, my wife, and I went to the Isle of Man races. If you haven't been on the Isle of Man for the TT or not aware of what that is. I'm, I'm familiar with it. I would love to go. That, yeah. That's amazing. So, but for people listening, you know, go to YouTube and go Isle of Man, Isle of Man, TT. And what this is, it's a Isle Island uh, called Isle of Man between um, uh, England and Ireland. It's a very small island. There's a 37 and a half mile course, which are public roads before these guys take off and they race motorcycles around there. Uh, it's five laps, 37 miles a lap, 200 turns. And, you know, these guys are amazing, right? It's, if you have, it's, it's just an amazing race. But they also have the thing called the TT0, which is it's one lap with an electric motorcycle. And pretty much no one watches that. Yeah. It's, it, you know. <laughs> I <can imagine. laughs> so uh, I, I think um, there will be some interest because I think it'll bring people in that maybe haven't been involved in drag racing, but like someone might, like myself. You know, I don't have any desire to go play with that stuff. And there'll be people that, you know, will be interested and follow it. Mm. That brings a few new people in. But I think a lot of people will just say, no, that's not, you know, for me. And we'll have to see how that pans out. But, uh, yeah, I mean, and they're super heavy. Yeah. I mean, they're super, super heavy. Like uh, that electric Cobra jet, you know, rumor had it that it was over 5,000 pounds. And they had Jeez, to do, a, they had insane. to do special work to get the, um, uh, you know, the, the vehicle safe enough. Cause again, yeah. you know, to be able to stop and if something horrible did happen unexpected, which does happen at the drag strip, I did total the car there myself. Um, you know, it's gotta be safe for the person driving it. Well, you know, from your drag racing background that, uh, different SFI certifications have maximum weights because of that reason, because mm -hmm. it's just so much mass. If you hit the wall, the heavier it is, the bigger problems you have. So uh, that's uh, from a racing perspective and safety perspective. I've never really thought about that. safety perspective mm. as far as the batteries and mm. catching on fire. I've thought about, but not just the sheer weight of the vehicle, especially in a drag racing environment where you know it's not completely out of the norm to to hit a wall, yeah. uh, especially on a fast vehicle. So all right, enough electric stuff. Okay. I want to uh, circle back. Uh, you touched on it earlier. Um, what is now Ford Performance, Ford Racing when you were there. Um, obviously, I don't even know what Dodge, does Dodge have something equivalent I, to that? I think the, uh, I, yeah, they, they do. Um, but we don't even know the name of it. So that already oh, tells it might, us. It might be a part of the SRT guys, you know, <laughs> right. but yeah, they, they do. Direct Connection, you yep. know, is part yeah, of it. Yeah, but to me, it's different. Yeah. Like, and then, you know, GM does have GM Performance parts, which mm -hmm. uh, I don't know how well you know Dr. Meyer, yep. Jamie Meyer, he's going to be a guest here soon too. Uh, he turned our, his back on us four guys and went to GM for a long time. Just kidding. Uh, so you know, and he did a great job there. He by did the way. a great job. I love Jamie. He was very important to me getting into this business. Period. Uh, so, um, but uh, I, maybe because I'm not a GM guy, I don't really put GM Performance in the same breath as Ford uh, Ford Racing, Ford Performance. Mm -hmm. Um, a lot of people don't really understand exactly how that works, maybe even myself. So maybe you can describe that to us a little bit. Like, uh, when, wh like at what point did Ford even launch that separate division? Sure. Or is it a division? How does it work? Yeah, so it, it's um, evolved through the years, right? Mm -hmm. So in 1982, same as the first year I started at Ford, um, 
I think it was Etzel that wanted to push, we should get back into NASCAR. Mm -hmm. So that Ford, um, re Ford Motorsport at the time, and that's another sore point with me. Let's come back to branding. Okay. Remember to come back to branding. <laughs> but uh, Ford Motorsport, I think at the time, uh, was formed, and they formed a small group, and they reached out, to, and they needed Ford Motorsport because to run a NASCAR, I think the block, the heads, and I think the sheet metal needed to come from the OE, I believe. I could be wrong, so if I'm wrong, someone can correct me. So they reached out to Jack Roush at the time, and Jack had a small little, you know, pamphlet of performance parts Jack offered that Ford used to kickstart their performance parts uh, business as well. And that started, I'm pretty certain, in 1982. And that was the genesis of, of, of the whys. Um, and Mose Nolan was part of that team. A guy named Don Sullivan was part of that team. Sully was a name, uh, he, you know, he was, he was, quote, old when I was young. Mm -hmm. And uh, he's no longer with us, but you know I think he did the tunnel port 427. I mean a lot of the stuff that was done, similar to Mose Nolan, Mose was a little younger than than Sully, was done, um, um, you know, uh, you know back in the 60s, and then they brought those guys in to help with this. And uh, Sully was I didn't really know Don Sullivan uh, personally, but one of the things I remember is that if you don't, you know, like people would like to come by and talk to him because he had so much knowledge and history, right? And we put a sign up because if you don't have something to do, do it elsewhere. You know, don't, in other words, don't bother me. He was very focused on, uh, on his job. Um, but that aside, that's how it started. And then it grew, you know, significantly from there. Uh, and then in the late 80s, um, there was a, a team of three guys that were mainly the performance parts guys. And that was Hank Dershon, um, Don Walsh Sr., Donnie's father. Mm -hmm. And uh, Donnie Walsh, for those of you know, is a guy that races now and has D&D uh, &D performance, or uh, I think Walsh Motorsports he has. Yep. And they use both names. Yep. And Ed uh, Lyons. And they were kind of the performance parts guys. Uh, Lyons kind of had small block stuff. Dershon had kind of a hodgepodge of many things and Walsh Sr. was uh, kind of the, the driveline guy. Mm -hmm. And that's, you know, the kick started that uh, performance parts. And then when the, you know, when the five liter Mustang, and that's an awesome story too, how the five liter Mustang came back into existence. Um, with the guy named Jim Clark again was the one that I would say is, if you love Fox Body Mustangs, it wasn't for Jim Clark, I don't think they'd be around. Uh, wow. uh, we can come back to that. Yeah, we'll definitely come back to that. But uh, so, uh, there was a guy named Wally Bieber who was in the five liter group and he was another older gentleman, you know, uh, again, old when I was young, he was in his sixties when I was in my twenties, super performance enthusiast. And, um, the GT 40 stuff came about with Wally was well under Jim Clark's, you know, kind of leadership was developing those parts and the program got canceled. So he called Hank Dersh and said, Hey, I got this stuff. It's already engineered. Do you want to put it in the catalog? You know, and Dershon said, yeah, sure, you know, we'll put it in the catalog. And then, you know, I was friends with Hank, and he said, hey, you want to try this stuff on your 86 Mustang? We'll see how it works. So I got the parts from them. We put it on the car. And, of course, you know, I'd say the rest is history because the GT40 stuff took off really, really well. So Ford Motorsport um, was mainly the racing and the performance parts. Um, you know, and then they changed the name to Ford Racing and then, you know, Ford Performance. And it probably had some other name in between. Um, but with that, um, when I ran the division, I mean, I came from a super intense line job. Mm. So, um, I was, what was called an LL2, one level below a corporate officer. And, you know, yeah, you had to go to the races on the weekends, but like, it's like, it was nowhere near intense. I mean, I was, you know, when I ran like engine engineering or I ran controls and calibration for a period of, for a long period of time and as installed components, I mean, I would get to work at 5.30 in the morning and leave at seven at night, and you were there Saturday and Sunday, I mean, it was intense. The Ford performance, uh, or the Ford uh, racing job wasn't that in time demanding. Mm -hmm. And I remember going to my boss and said, you know, if we rolled um, Ford performance vehicles along with this, so we'd have the Ford performance vehicles at one end, the Ford racing support at the other end, and the Ford performance parts to bridge the gap, I said, that would probably be a job that would be intense enough for this level of compensation. 
They didn't do it at that time, um, but a few years later, Ford Performance is born. Mm. And so here's, I'm gonna get my, my gripe on branding, right? People talk about how long it takes to develop a brand, right? Mm. So we had SVO, then it was SVT, then it was Ford Performance Vehicles. And that was more to stroke executives equals, like corporate officers. I mean, they could have said, we've got a new division called Ford Performance, and it's made up of Ford Racing and SVT, and it's all under this Ford Performance brand, and still respect to me the people that bought all the Ford Racing parts and the old SVT customers. Mm -hmm. But no, they had to put their name on it and change it to Ford Performance, which always really kind of pissed me off to be quite blunt. It was like, you know, why'd you do that? I mean, you only did stroke your eagle. I mean, how do you think the SVT guys feel now that you don't have yeah, SVT anymore? I remember when that happened and everybody was like, why are they getting rid of that name? Like, you know, it, people like, I mean, that's the point of a brand, right? To yeah. identify with it, pull it all together, and then just boom, you just get rid of that brand. It was... Yeah, yeah and Ford Performance products are awesome, right? So, you know, we have, a, uh, you know, a... And, uh, an SVT, uh, I think it was SVT Fiesta ST. I don't think it was Ford Performance yet. And then we had a couple Raptor pickups. And now my wife's got a right Raptor Bronco. So I love the vehicles, right? Mm -hmm. They're not, they're awesome. I just wish that we would, you know, you'd think with a company like Ford, a family company, we'd stick to the brand, right? And yeah, names. What, uh, what time period were you uh, there? When did you I, start it? Uh, I was there uh, 08 to 10. Okay. So, um, I think that'd be an interesting uh, take on the vehicles. Well, first off, let's mm. the big, big one that you were, I believe, mm. responsible for was the Cobra Jets, right? Yes. So what happened? Yeah, the Cobra Jets. Uh, interesting story on the Cobra Jets, right? And probably if you ask three different people, four different people that were close, they all probably put a little bit different spin on it. Mm -hmm. But um, as I mentioned, I ran a, 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 that was it was called Core and Advanced Powertrain, and then we changed it to Powertrain Engineering. So. What I was accountable for was the powertrain control software, powertrain control modules, and all the as-installed components. So intakes, exhaust, catalyst, fuel systems, cooling systems. So I had basically everything with the base engine and transmission. It was a pretty big job. And uh, Jamie Allison, who was the performance uh, Ford Racing uh, performance parts manager at the time, you know, he would occasionally need help with stuff. And of course, being, you know, performance enthusiast, you know, mm -hmm. hey, you know, Jamie needs help. Let's, you know, get this help and we'll get this through certification or whatever. So one of the things that was going on in the background was NHRA was talking to Ford, GM, and Chrysler about bringing back some type of modern, you know, heads-up class that would appeal, you know, to, to fans, you mm -hmm. know. And I had two friends, a guy named Jimmy Runs, I still have him, had. I have two friends, named, one's Jimmy Ronzello and the other night named Mike Pistelny. And they were saying, yeah, you know, NHRA's having this meeting, but the Ford guy that represent him just doesn't seem too enthused. You know, can you do anything to maybe push those guys a little bit? So I called Jamie and I said, you know, I'd really like to, you know, help with this because you guys don't really know NHRA sportsman racing. You know, you're only kind of helping the funny car guys you know, you're okay if we start a NHRA advisory committee. And so what I wanted to do was, you know, reach out to I, the sportsmen who put their own money into polishing the Ford Blue Oval. I thought that was important because that's what mm -hmm. I always did. You know, I, I, there, I had a lot of time for that. So we started the discussions. And then I kind of mentioned on this new class a little bit. And uh, Jim and I invited, so it was the Ford performance guys, myself as not really accountable, but wanting to influence. And then uh, Jimmy Ronzello was there too, who was a experimental build, uh, engine experimental build technician at Ford, but super long history in NHRA racing. He was a stock, super stock racer for many years. And we started this, you know, these discussions. And then um, there was a guy, very popular guy, who you probably know, um, named Jesse Kershaw. Yeah, he was the marketing guy in uh, Ford uh, Racing, and you know he sent me. And I, I said we ought to do something like this and support this class. You know, so the way I described is Jamie and a guy named Andy Slankert, who was a supervisor that worked for him, were coming to the meetings and talking to me more to pacify me because I was a director and I was helping them and they respected the position and 
okay, we'll pass fine, but we're never going to do this thing, right? Right. And, uh, and Jesse had this, he told me this PowerPoint that he was carrying around for three years and no one would take it seriously. But it was talked about doing a drag car, you know, and he took the name from the past Cobra Jet that kind of defined what it would be, which was a kind of a GT500 powertrain. And, a, I, and I don't remember how much detail he had in that to be open. I don't know if he had the powertrain in there or not. I think he did. And I remember him sending it to me. I said, wow, yeah, this is exactly what we were talking about. You know, I sent it to Jamie. Like, he sent it to me. I read it within the first half hour of receiving an email. I sent it to Jamie. And then Jamie was back at Jesse's desk and said, what the hell did you send Brian Wolf? <laughs> you know? Right, right. And uh, so, you know, they were pacifying me a little bit. And then this was in the uh, uh, beginning of 08, maybe-ish. And my time frame's a little fuzzy because I'm an old guy and I might... I don't remember the exact dates, but uh, long story short, all of a sudden, um, Dan Davis retires, and who comes in as a new director of, uh, you know, Ford Racing, uh, you know, Ford Racing Technologies, it was called, uh, me, and I remember Andy's telling the story, said, he goes, oh, shit, we're really going to have to do this thing now, and uh, I said, look, I'm not, you don't have to do it because I want to do it, I said, if we can't sell 50 of these, because what happened is, we had FR 500 S's, which was the road race car, yep. spec racer. And we had like 20, some of them sit in the warehouse we couldn't off. I said, we're not gonna do that again. That's the, we're, we're not. Mm -hmm. I said, if we don't get at least 50 pre-orders, we're not doing it, mm -hmm. you know? So uh, uh, Jesse put the notification together for the dealers and there's a guy named Brett Hayek who is a super Ford enthusiast historian that had a, has a museum uh, in Oklahoma, I believe. Because he's got like all this cornfields there, and he's a you know, and that you see, sells the eighty-five or corn to the eighty-five guys that make it and stuff, and and called him and said, "Look, Wolf said if we don't sell fifty of these, we're not going to do it." And he said, "I'll take 10. <laughs> and these I think <laughs> wow. were seventy grand at the time. Yeah, wow. okay. So uh, between him and I think Jackie Jones bought six of them, uh, and you know, so again, got the fifty orders in forty-eight hours. Wow. Commitments. That's amazing. So that car. Do you from, think uh, a lot of it had to do with it being a Cobra Jet in name? Like I think the nostalgia of it? I and do. you get all the guys that knew those cars when they were younger and now they're going to afford it. And it's like, this is my opportunity to have, you know, a dream I agree, car. I agree. I, that's what it seemed like to me. You know? I, I agree. I think the name had a lot to do with it. And again, I think it was, I think it was Jesse that came up with the name. I, I had a discussion uh, with another guy that was super instrumental, a guy named Larry Farron, who was uh, worked in Andy Slanker's group to get the prototypes made and stuff. Mm -hmm. And I was a little fuzzy on the name, but um, Jimmy Ronzello said no, it was Jesse in that PowerPoint that had the name. So I, I, I think that was uh, Jesse's uh, idea to have that name. Yeah, Jesse, uh, I don't know how long he was there, but he seemed to have a pretty big impact because Jesse is the person that I worked with to get Coyote Stock founded. Mm -hmm. Because when I went to the NMRA with the idea, they said, well, that sounds great, but you have to get Ford to do it, and mm -hmm. I don't think you're going to get Ford to do it, like the sealed engine part. Mm -hmm. And at that point, Jesse was going to all the races, and he was very approachable, super. Mm -hmm. Didn't realize how good we had it till Jesse was gone, honestly, not mm -hmm. speaking badly about whoever came after him, but Jesse was very uh, good at bringing people together, I would say. Mm -hmm. And I approached him, and he's like, man, I like that idea. Let me go see what we can do. And then he was the one that pulled off being able to seal the engine so the Coyote Stock program could get off its feet. So yeah. I didn't realize he was that mm -hmm. instrumental in getting the ball rolling on Cobra Jet. So. Yeah, no, he was, uh, um, you know, he, and again, he, he, you know, he was in a tough spot because there wasn't a lot of support for drag racing because, mm -hmm. um, you know, we had John Forrest and, you know, and you know people and the executives typically like road racing because drag racing is for you know so yeah. you rednecks like me and not for the champagne crowd right so that was uh so you know he had he was kind of always in an uphill you know battle until then you know, the short time that i was there yeah. but uh i remember he him bring coyote stock and this you're, you're <laughs> i thought well that's silly because being an engine guy right. i said why the Heck, would you want a, you know, to seal the engine? I mean, right. what fun is that? You know, <laughs> and uh, but but I was 100 percent wrong because you know you, you know the guys buy the sealed crate motors, you know, and they're in the car for three years. I mean, and there's, and there's no other place you're going to have that much fun, be able to race heads up for the amount of money it takes to build a competitive car. I think I have more had more in my no, I had more in my X275 engine. I could have probably built 
a car and had a complete backup powertrain for right. a coyote stock. So I think it was a super good idea. And, you know, it, I mean, there's 20 of them out there at, the, at NMRA yeah. now when they show up. Yeah, every race. I mean, it's been, uh, you know, I didn't do much after it got mm-hmm. started, but mm-hmm. I felt like I... I was pretty instrumental in getting it going and also keeping it healthy because when the class the, that class launched, it wasn't a success. Mm-hmm. It took a year or two because people had to build cars and then they wanted to allow automatics mm-hmm. and then a weight break and the whole concept of the classes. There's just one set of rules. Mm-hmm. There's no this combo gets this weight or this combo gets this weight. And I think that's been the reason that it's been successful because it's a no BS class, right? Mm-hmm. There's just other than like trying to find somebody cheating or anything like that, you're going to show up and have the same basic horsepower and, you know, ability to go as quick as anybody else. But yet, you know, the new guys are, you know, tense off and then each time they keep going. But the coolest thing about it, which, you know, you alluded to as far as like, why would anybody want to seal the engine and mess with it? most of those engines wind up getting messed with, right? Mm. That's what's so great about it. It's such a durable and awesome engine. Somebody will race it for two or three years and then go, you know what? I'm gonna break the seals, I'm gonna build the motor, I'm gonna Mm. go race factory stock now, or Mm. I'm gonna build the motor and just put a blower on it, you know? So it's not like you're buying Mm. some off variant that's only usable in one area and some sealed engine that nobody would want otherwise. Right. It's what everybody wants and you just seal it for the short term and then if you want to mess with it down the road and go somewhere else you're not buying a whole different engine it's the platform is just amazing and now you know at each generation it seemingly was almost the death of the class like oh the gen 2's out and like how are we going to handle that and then the gen 3 came out oh they're going to be too fast and now it's a nine second class you know right it's it's just crazy to me uh so um jesse you know was a huge part of that uh, i didn't want to go too mm. far off from the Cobra Jet thing. So, but one, one thing, if I could just add to that, and to me that's important of taking the feedback, because like I said, I wasn't a supporter of it, right. but I listened to Jesse, and I don't know if, if it was actually kicked off when I was there or after I left, but, you know, again, you got to listen to the team and respect, you know, like you said, Jesse had a lot of feedback from, you know, the racers, and he has to, you know, take it, and, you know, I did support it, but again, I don't remember what year it first started, if I was there when they first started selling engines, or if it was after I left, but uh, again, the importance of, if you've got people in a team, you got to respect them and listen to them. Yeah, and beyond the sealing of the engine, the other part that really made that important, which is partly why the Coyote is popular in the swap market, is Ford Performance comes out with the swap kit, the computer and the harness and all that sort of stuff. So how, like, does Ford just basically decide to do that based on, you know, like, do they, do they make a a seven, three control pack swap? They do. Um, the, I believe the current swap kit though only works with a 10 R one forty. Okay. And I go, you know, I said, you know, how's that going to work? Cause that 10 R one forty is so big. Yeah. that it's not going to fit in most cars. So this is probably like, if I would have been a Ford Performance, you know, like the right. little difference, right? So it makes sense from an engineering perspective, right? We can just take the software that's there, we can modify the calibration, turn off, you know, some things, and, you know, and also try to make it more adaptable to a vehicle, because the 10-speed is really hard to calibrate. I mean, yeah. it, is, it is not easy. So the guys, you know, but they had a, a start point, but I would have said, well, yeah, we got to do a control pack for it but you got to do it for a manual first right i don't care if it takes longer there's going to be a lot more market for either you know putting a different automatic behind it or a manual than putting a 10r 140 because it doesn't even work with a 10r 80 it's got to be a 10r 140 yeah and i you know there's a lot of those out there because of probably electric vehicle swaps or well no it doesn't even work with the swaps because the vehicle the (laughs) The Amazon swap vehicles that people are selling the powertrains out of is a 6R140. So I had the, no idea. Yeah. So <laughs> it's a 6R. Because, again, the, you know, again, it was about variable cost, right? So to go into that chassis third vehicle, 6R140 is a lot less expensive. 
And also, we didn't have to worry about the capacity for the pickup trucks. To explain that real quick, yep. you're talking about a chassis vehicles where like it's a, a super duty type platform, but there's no bed and or whatever, and it gets built out into something else. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Leave the vehicle that leave the Ford plant is an incomplete vehicle, so it's a Dyno Cert vehicle. And those are the ones that came with the six speed. Yes. Is that the only thing a six R one forty is in? I believe the answer to that is yes. I can't. Because I maybe the some of the Econoline cutaways, mm. um, because again the, you know that was another application the cutaway vehicles that they still had the Econoline for. I don't know if it, again being gone from Ford for what five and a half or six and a half years now. Um, I don't know if that was there, but when I was there, that was also one of the applications. But again, it left the plant as an incomplete vehicle, so I'm guessing that had a those had six R one forties in them. So uh, back to the Cobra Jet real quick. That came with multiple powertrains mm -hmm. at some point. What is that basically because of NHRA and rules and trying to fit, you know, certain criteria? Yeah. So again, the goal was is to allow the sportsman racers, right, something in a modern vehicle that they could race in stock and super stock. Mm -hmm. So that was the purpose of putting like a 352, which was a uh, a 302, you know, a larger 302, or a 428, which was a larger 351, or a 463 valve, or a 5 liter NA, to you know make something so that you could you know drive a more modern looking car, and that mm -hmm. also, in my opinion, you know helps you know the marketing and the polishing the blue ovals. So when people go to the track and watch the stockers and super stockers, oh, I've got a car like that, you mm -hmm. know, and again that re re being able to relate. Yeah. One interesting thing that Cobra Jet uh, uh, program, and I kind of remember this at the time, and you being there, uh, I'd like to see some, hear some insight on this. So what transmission were, were in those? Uh, the first year, 08, it had the same transmission that the GT500 has. In 2010, it could be a Power Glide or a Liberty. Uh, but you guys didn't maybe. call it a Power Glide, did you? <laughs> no, no, we probably That's called what it. I'm alluding yeah. to. I it remember. was probably a two-speed C4. <laughs> yeah, right, what we called it. Or it said like two-speed race trans or something. That yeah. was like we'd all kind of joke about it a little yeah. bit because it's like Ford doesn't want to admit they're using a GM transmission in it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah and, and, and uh, yeah, absolutely. But you know, and again, you know, truth be told, there probably wasn't one GM part in it. Kind of like my right. X275 small block Ford, right? You know, right. It, was, it was a small block Ford, but there wasn't one Ford part in it. You know, block heads, all oh, that was was different. But I think we, I think we, I was probably a little sensitive to that. But yeah, bottom line was a yeah. aftermarket power glide. I just thought that case. was a, 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 I kind of mm -hmm. remember like joking, but it was like, what transmission is in it? It's, a, it's got a power glide in it. It's like, that's not what it says here. I'm like, well, they're not going to say it's a GM <laughs> power glide. Yeah. You know, so. And it's, then a lot of them had, uh, you know, Joel, uh, Joel's on Joy. Mm -hmm. uh, they built most of the auto. In fact, I think they built, not most, they built all the automatics for that. In the future years, it was a three speed. So, um, I'm a little ignorant to this. Where is that program? They don't. They don't make. Yeah, the last year was 19. Yeah. Okay. So and that uh, was uh, it was supposed to be an 1850th anniversary, but I think it came. They didn't have any of them. They didn't have the program done, so it came out in 19. And I believe if you look in the NHRA guide, it's listed as a 19, not mm -hmm. an 18. Um, but anyway, that was the last one. So I think we did them in 2008, 10, 12, 13, 14, 16, and 18. So or 19. with Ford Performance, you know, there's all these specialty vehicles. Like you mentioned mm -hmm. the Bronco Raptor, which I have one, which mm -hmm. is just one of my favorite vehicles ever. I love it. Mm -hmm. I mean, I had a regular Bronco. Mm -hmm. I had them all. I had the small one, I had mm -hmm. the Wild Track, and then now the Bronco Raptor. And they followed the pricing, which is mm -hmm. everyone got a little bit better. Mm -hmm. um, but that's obviously a production vehicle. And there's many Ford Performance production vehicles, but then there's non-production vehicles like the Cobra Jet, but mm -hmm. then, you know, like the newest stuff, like the dark, not dark horse, but the, you know, I oh, the know GT3, the GT3 mm -hmm. and all the different race variants, you know, and they've done that throughout the years. Like the, um, what was the, they didn't call it the GT4, uh, the road race car, like you're, years you're right. back, like that mm -hmm. was based off the newer S550 platform. Are those specialty race vehicles, Cobra Jet, road race cars being developed alongside the production version of Ford Performance or are those two different things? Okay, yeah, so the, the individual that runs the, if you will, the 
specialty race prepared cars that you buy from the factory mm -hmm. uh, is a different individual than the person that's in charge of, if you will, like the uh, uh, the volume production street car. So I classified as not street legal, no mm -hmm. VIN, and street legal VIN cars. Which makes sense because yeah. the requirements to design a Bronco Raptor are very different than designing a GT4, yet mm -hmm. they're both Ford Performance. So in my mind, I'm like envisioning, mm -hmm. you know, what it looks like there. And I'm like, that's just so very different. Uh, but obviously, so they're just basically, they're run almost like there's two different people, but mm -hmm. the people are separate too, right? The Absolutely. people working on the GT4 or the GT3 or all the different vehicles are totally different than the GT500. Right. There may be Bronco. some cross-fertilization on like, sure. it was a new platforms coming about talking, you know, kind of like I mentioned when I had, you know, the powertrain engineering components mm. and, you know, Jamie would ask me questions, right? Total, you know, one's in marketing, one's in PD, product mm. development, but again, offering that assistance. So I'm sure that type of cross-communication has to be going on, mm. but as far as the team accountable for each, you know, di different areas. And, and how does the, 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 the planning of a production performance vehicle like a GT500 mm -hmm. or the, the Bronco Raptor or the regular Ra the F-150 mm -hmm. Raptor, like um, how often are those proposed and they don't happen? You know what I mean? Like, like what's behind that? How do they become? Yeah, you know, I'm not as, you know, familiar to be, you know, fully, you know, transparent with those processes. Yeah. You know, like, you know, when I was there, typically... You know, there was a, you know, like, you know, Coletti is probably the most popular mm -hmm. outside known guy that uh, ran SVT, right? Mm -hmm. And, you know, they would propose stuff going forward, just like a production Mustang program. Mm -hmm. You know, and it would have to make financial sense, et cetera, um, to, to proceed. Mm -hmm. um, I think, um, uh, and I, I think and assume that probably that same process goes, you know, takes place today. Yeah. So, you know, they'll put a proposal together, uh, there may be money even put in the cycle plan as a holding point. Like, hey, you know, we've got um, a new Mustang, you know, coming out uh, in 14. We're going to want to do uh, a Shelby version of that. We're mm. going to put a placeholder in the cycle plan with so much money to do that. And then as time goes on, you know, the actual team that's going to do it will start to define what that's going to look like and then take it forward for approvals. And that's what I was looking at. Like, so... They carve out a spot, say, for the new GT500, but mm -hmm. a specific team is tasked with really defining what that might be. Like, right. so I know that was after you were gone, but like, say, the 2020 GT500, mm -hmm. like, who decides that power plant? Like, you, you typically, um, or the whole thing? Like, is that, it's does that go it down to like, one guy on a team that's like, hey, I think we should do this, and everybody gets behind him. No, or? typically that, that would be like in, if you will, there, there's a planning organization mm -hmm. for it. So you got, you know, so you, you have marketing and sales, right? Mm -hmm. That is a lot of the folks that you, you know, pe most journalists and people will interface with mm -hmm. uh, the marketing team. Then behind the scenes, if you will, making, and they'll help with, we think we can sell so many of these, and here's what the price point needs to be, and, you know, trying to define what the, the customer is. Then uh, there's a team that, uh, if you will, is called planning. Mm -hmm. So they'll look at the cycle plan like maybe 10 years out, five years out, and just kind of put a placeholder. Okay, mm -hmm. we're going to want to do a GT500. We think that it's going to be based off the Coyote engine, mm -hmm. you know, an upgrade to the previous one, and, you know, very rough, I call it level of assumptions, mm -hmm. right? It's gonna, and then as things get closer, then within the product development team, they'll start to get involved and start adding, if you will, the, the definition. Mm -hmm. So like on the, the, the 2020, I was there when we were started where, on it. Yeah, when yeah. we started on that on that engine. And um, you know, the, the power requirements were important. Um, and then also the on track performance was important because one of the things that a lot of the Corvette people were complaining about was, hey, I make three laps and all of a sudden the car's punched slower because it didn't cool, it got really hot, right. and um, you know they de derated the engine, right? So right. that was a big thing's gone wrong, which happened before this 2020 came out. So I do remember, you know, we're doing a lot of discussions. Well, you know, this has to last like 20 minutes 
on a road course. And I don't remember what road course it was. It might have been Gingerman. I, I don't know. I don't remember. I shouldn't even have said that since I don't remember. <laughs> but it's got to last like a a, a, um, a, a track session mm. without being derated, mm. um, which is probably one of the reasons why um, once they came out, it was easy to maybe tune and get more out of it because, again, Ford was sensitive to that. So I think that was really smart. I had nothing to do with that. That was kind of the, the vehicle team reading what was going on in, the, in social media and saying, well, we don't want to have this issue, right? Yeah. So p- pretty clever guys. Yeah. Yeah. The inside, I guess, I was looking for, which you pretty much summed up. Uh, but if you can expand on it, if you know, like, to me, the 2020 GT500 was multiple steps forward from other performance vehicles Ford's have has released, not counting, like, the Ford mm-hmm. GT and all that, you know? Mm-hmm. Right. But, like... Under, sub hundred thousand dollar car. Well, that's really the point, right? How who decides to jump from a fifty or fifty five thousand dollar GT five hundred to an eighty thousand dollar GT five hundred? I'm super happy they did that. I never expected us to have a vehicle at the level of the 2020 GT five hundred. Feel like it was a little bit of a, you know, like a bait and switch in in a good way, right? right. Like here's a Mustang and it's 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 fast and it's got a lot of power, but it doesn't turn that good and you know, right. blah blah blah. And then all of a sudden we have a like a top level, any brand, any, there's, I, there's not a car under hundred grand to me. And obviously I'm a GT 500 guy mm. that could even be in the same conversation as the GT 500. Yeah. I would say <laughs> I would attribute that to, um, a couple of things. And this is just my opinion. Okay. So this, I'm not mm. going to say this is the absolute truth. And this right. is what happened. This is Brian's opinion from observation. So, I think what was going on was, you know, typically that would be between marketing, how much can you get for it, mm. and the guys that are defining the product on how much it's going to cost, and then can we make a business case out of this. But I think with people like Jim Farley mm. at the top, yep. you know, and Raj Nair, both of them super enthusiastic road race type guys, um, and then they're guy that was in charge at the time, Dave Parasek, wanted to make sure they were very happy with the project because he was a very motivated, you know, director wanting to, you know, deliver and deliver well, that, you know, between the guy at the top and the guys with the desire to deliver, um, that's probably what it took, right? Mm-hmm. I think under normal circumstances, without, you know, like you mentioned, like I, you know, influenced the Godzilla or I influenced the Cobra Jet, my opinion is that Raj and Jim Farley influenced that uh, that GT. Because I remember, I'll be honest, I wasn't a huge fan of the dual clutch. I said, man, this 10, you know, the 10 mm. speed in the GT is pretty good. I mean, you right. go into, you know, it shifts fast and it's, you know, pretty good, but it's not a dual clutch, right? Mm. And I remember how much that cost. I'm not going to go into that. Um, and, you know, the issues we had at the time with the Focus dual clutch, because mm. the dual clutch yeah. is really intended for a performance car, not a daily driver. Um, in other words, something with a lot of horsepower to weight ratio, like, mm-hmm. you know, like that car. And, you know, it was a struggle because, you know, it wasn't an easy task to make that as good as they made it. But they did. They did a great job. And, you know, again, that was like the Dave Parasak, right? The director, you know, again, that was delivering for Farley and Raj to make sure the product was good. So uh, I, I think that's how it happened. I could be wrong. Yeah. So, um during like a development of a vehicle like that, I had heard rumors that the DCT was even in danger at one point. You know, I don't know if that's true or not, or how it probably was at one point when they were having, when they were struggling. Yeah, they were struggling. And it's not only are they putting a transmission in that they've never really used in a performance, but it's a brand new transmission, right? Mm -hmm. It's Tremix new to this, Mm -hmm. you know, uh, it turned out to be, well, let's back up. The reason I asked about all that is because I remember when the car was announced, the general reaction to it before anybody really understood what they were getting for that money was like, are you nuts? Mm-hmm. Who's going to pay $80,000 for a mu- It's a Mustang. Mm-hmm. Nobody's going to pay $80,000 for a Mustang. Yet we're, uh, what, almost three and a half years into this. Right. And you still cannot buy a carbon fiber track pack edition for mm-hmm. MSRP. Yeah. And if you're buying a space model, you're probably still paying MSRP. Maybe even a little markup. That's amazing to me. On a, on, I mean, obviously... At a Ford the, production the, car. At a Ford period, <laughs> the general uh, used car market has been influencing that and all the 
again, politics around everything mm -hmm. and everything getting more expensive and hard to get and supply chain issues and things like that. But, you know, to think, uh, I mean, I just sold uh, one of my GT 500s and yes, it has a few performance parts on mm -hmm. it, uh, but I, 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 I sold it for $5,000 more than the MSRP, you know? And yes, mm -hmm. it has a few performance parts, so it's not like I sold it for more and it's a bone You're, stock vehicle, mm -hmm. but even to say that, 10 years, oh, I have a 2014 GT500. Oh, that's worth uh, 50. Oh, I have parts, I have things done to it. Oh, it's, it's worth, worth 40. <laughs> you know, like, and now, because it's such an amazing platform, the modifications to it allow, uh, like, it allows us to modify it in a way that is truly reliable. Like, mm -hmm. it's not like almost anything we've done in the past where it's like, yeah, you got all this extra power, but be careful of this. Don't do this. Don't do, you know, heat and let it rest. Like, not really. Yeah, I mean, some of them that we make 1,300 horsepower with, you still have to be gentle with them. <laughs> but if you do a normal build and make between 800 and 1,000 horsepower, which is crazy to even think about 15 years ago on a production vehicle with some bolt-ons, not only can you do it, but it's like, people are like, oh, well, you know, what do I need to know? I'm like, nothing, just floor it. It's, mm. you know, it's gonna take care of itself. And that's due to all the technology and Ford continuing to go forward. And uh, well, well, on that note, Ford has resisted what the other manufacturers are doing so far as like, we're going all in electric, we're getting rid of the V8, you know, all mm. that sort of uh, theme there. How long do you think Ford could hold off on that? Yeah, you know, boy, I, I tell you, anybody's crystal ball on that is as good as mine being, you know, gone so far, uh, or so long from Ford. But, mm -hmm. you know, GM just announced, and I think the, I kind of feel like it made me smile when I saw GM's investing $900 million in a new V8 truck plant. And I oh, think, really? Yeah, and I, I, think that, that. I think that's because, of, like, they saw the Godzilla was so much better than what they had, so I'm anxious to see what they do to their, uh, you know, do to their platform to, uh, to, to, to respond to it. Um, but... You know, Ford has, you know, you said they're going to do a lot in electric, but they've all, but, you know, again, you know, the truck market, they haven't been, you know, so fast. The new Mustang, mm. you know, is, um, uh, you know, people are saying, well, it's probably going to be the last one with an internal combustion engine. I don't know. Mm. Um, like the autonomous vehicles, you know, I call it, you know, kind of the Kool-Aid on that because, you know, the people that are close to it and the reason it was being pushed so heavily was, you know, Google figured out that, you know, people spend, like, especially in California, an average of an hour and a half on the day of the car. They said, well, that's an hour and a half that they could be surfing the Internet, that we could be making money off of advertising. Mm -hmm. So if we could do autonomous cars, we can make a lot more money on our mainstream business of advertising. So they were investigating, you know, heavily into autonomous vehicles. But the guys like, you know, just engineers that are used to doing failure mode and effect analysis say, well, isn't that the first rule of robotics? you know, that the robot can't hurt a human, yeah? So if someone steps out in front of the car, it, it's gonna stop, can't hit the person, right? Yep. So if someone stepped in front of it and someone stepped behind it, the car can't move, right? Yeah. And if you take the steering wheel and gas brake out, the car can't move. And people inside are sitting ducks, if you will, for yeah. something bad to happen. So how are you gonna address that? Or how are you going to address the LIDAR working in Michigan in the middle of winter? You know, there's a lot of these issues. I mean, they were, you can do an enormous amount of things, but even airplanes have to go off autopilot when the weather is really bad, right? Right. To, to land them. So a lot of it, like you said, you know, people get caught up in, I don't want to say propaganda, because that's not the right word, but the excitement maybe of the day mm. without fully thinking everything out. And I think as you, we talked a little earlier about electric vehicles, I think sooner or later, the elephant will come out from behind the curtain and they're gonna say, well, how are you really gonna charge all these things? How are you really gonna mine all the material, raw materials for the batteries? How are you, you know, gonna make all this possible? And, mm -hmm. you know, things are going, you know, you know, so far in some regards where if you look at like, we used to call that Ford, well, like mining the raw materials mm. to wheel, actually getting, mm. you know, producing CO2 out the back, uh, you know, what's the real total picture story, you know? And at one point in time, it was like, well, an electric vehicle would have to go um, 
a hundred thousand miles to make up for the CO2 it cost to put it in the showroom mm -hmm. if it would have been an internal combustion vehicle. So, you know, you, you, you got to look at the total picture and, you know, so many people that are so, I guess, opinionated on it don't understand the full impact. So, you know, there, there's a lot of issues to address. But again, as I mentioned earlier, I think there are things you could do quickly to have an impact on society mm. that makes sense anyways from a, in my mind, from a total, you know, humanity perspective like these large cities where you got diesels you know idling and right. spewing out particulates even though you got a particulate filter i mean you know when you live in europe and you drive behind these vehicles with part you know with uh, that are diesels and they got particulate filters you know you there's a lot of black on the bumpers you know it's not there for <laughs> because they're clean right right yeah i mean i guess i maybe this is like wishful thinking but i'm hoping the whole electric thing is sort of how uh when we look back on when we were supposed to switch to the metric system in the United States, mm -hmm. I'm hoping it works out the same. It's like, well, we thought it would be a good idea, but the logistics of it all and everything, mm -hmm. it just wasn't going to work out. And yeah, there's people that I use a metric system all the time. Everybody does. You know, I uh, design work. I work in metric a lot. But in general, we still, you know, use Imperial here. And uh, I'm hoping we have the same resistance <laughs> to the electric thing. And over mm -hmm. time, we realize that uh, it may mm -hmm. be a good focused use but it's certainly not going to become the standard I, I don't I, I don't think it, yeah, I don't think it's a complete answer I think it does I think it's great for a lot of folks yeah you know especially like if you you know live in a place where you you know can get the 50 amp for charging you know in your home and not impact other things you got enough electricity there um, if you drive you commute you know 30 miles one way to work and mm. you know it, it, you know there's a convenience factor there um, but again to me it's just like it's not the only solution just like you don't only we don't only have gas we don't only have diesel we only have fiestas we only don't have f-350s right. you know there's different solutions for different needs and i kind of think that's where it's going to kind of fall yeah and i think that's what makes me um question things like the lightning you know the mm -hmm. the, the truck electric truck it's like in theory when it was announced it's i was like wow that's pretty cool actually and mm -hmm. the generator and all that and as a vehicle i heard it's great mm -hmm. but as a truck i mean i don't think anybody could say it's anything but a failure as far as towing stuff or moving mm -hmm. stuff around and obviously ford had to know that when they released it like how mm -hmm. it was going to wind up towing so yeah. is that you know i feel like it, they're yeah. pushing it beyond like sensibility almost like why would you even push that out there uh, with it being such a poor performer as a actual truck you know yeah and I, I you know I don't know is it yeah. you know yeah. being fully transparent um, but on the other hand I would say like a lot of f-150 owners no. never hook a trailer on their vehicle so yeah if yeah. you're if you're you know if you go to Home Depot and you're picking up lumber you're doing yard work you're yeah. driving 30 miles one way to work it's probably a real good solution for some folks but again you know i would say don't advertise it as something that's maybe not as good at like you know towing you know yeah. like i remember there was a every towing youtube stuff i've seen has been pretty damning right yeah except I, there was one that was done in california and it was an open trailer they set the ac at like 79 degrees and they towed at 55 miles an hour and i go and, and it performed reasonable right, right? And i go yeah like who does that who paid these people to, to to make that their duty cycle right um so uh, you know you know talk about you know like there was a guy we had at ford that was a very you know he's a group vice president retired guy named richard perry jones and he was a real car enthusiast super smart dude but like most of us, myself included, I've got so many faults, I can't begin to list them. So I don't want to, you know, pretend like I, you know, my opinions are correct. And, you know, I, there's a lot that's, that's wrong there. But he used to make a statement, we want to be the most knowledgeable for our customers' needs. But the problem that many people have, especially successful people, is they believe everybody wants what they want. Mm -hmm. They don't really reach out to what people want mm, right. and i thought when I, I i think i do that you know reasonable well like when i was at ford performance it wasn't just road racing i mean i love drag racing it wasn't just drag racing and i remember when we at pri you know we had like a, a hot rod section of the booth uh roundy rounds you know or you know uh 
roundy round a road race section. We had a drag race. We had, you know, street performance. And, you know, one of the guys came in and he said, wow, this is the best, you know, booth I've ever seen at Ford because normally you guys just focus on that. You only nurture one person. I said, well, to me, anybody that wants to modify their Ford is special because they're paying money to make us look good. Right. And I think that's what, you know, I, I see the biggest fault in some some successful people is they don't take into account what, you know, the total population, mm. you know, they're kind of thinking what they want. And, uh, you know, it's like why with that lightning is, well, we'll make it, you know, make it look good towing. Well, okay, we will, but, you know, it's like no one's going to tow like this. Exactly. <clears throat> so uh, one question I wanted to ask you, and I don't know how much insight you have here, but even your opinion, um, since I'm a tuner, it's very, the, the most important thing to me is the OEM allowing us to flash it. Security trying to stop us from tuning those vehicles. Did Ford have any real position on that? Obviously Dodge, I think, was like the first ones to really lock it down and GM got aggressive there a few years ago. We have a few locked PCMs and there's different reasons mm -hmm. to lock the computers, of course. Some of them are newer sure. things like over-the-air updates, but purely from an aftermarket perspective, because you had mentioned that, uh, you know, these people make us look good, right? Mm -hmm. So, you know, we're taking GT500s and doubling the horsepower. Does Ford care about that at all? Well, again, from a, I think, a corporate perspective, yes, right? Because, mm -hmm. again, you know, the, the, where it comes into effect is, you know, play is warranty, right? Mm -hmm. So, you know, if the aftermarket tuner, you know, puts a bunch of spark in, the customer's got the wrong fuel, and they put holes in pistons, uh, you know, that's not good. I remember when the Taurus show was out mm -hmm. and i remember the videos were coming out the guy's running like 1280 he's got you know he's modified a bunch he puts a hole in the piston all of a sudden you know someone saw that video and then they saw the car come in for an engine replacement you're not going to get it you, right. know, you you changed it i remember when i was at ford performance and when i was in controls and calibration they were talking about locking down the mustang i was adamantly against it because i said well, you know part of the reason people buy the Mustang is they want to be able to modify it. Now they got to mod know they're modifying it at their own risk, yeah. but to lock them out is kind of locking away one of the, in my opinion, one of the historically great parts about a Mustang. Right. And uh, so I was, you know, not in favor of, uh, of that. But on the other hand, you know, you, you know, at your, at your own risk, right? Because, right. you know, it's in the big thing, like the diesels, right? Like, you know, guys are going and modify the diesel trucks and get tons more torque and they'd be blowing smoke out the back. And, you know, and like I say, it's not that the Ford engineers are stupid and can't get that, right. but there's reasons they don't. Right. You know, sometimes it's reliability limits of the vehicle. And, you know, Ford has, you know, stringent durability requirements. Um, one of the things that when I was, you know, still there, that we ran on durability on engines was we'd run at the torque peak 50 hours in borderline detonation, 50 hours, wide open throttle, borderline detonation, torque peak, followed by 50 hours at the power peak and the engine, you know, couldn't fail pistons. And, and all the engines do that? Yeah. And that's just like 50 hours straight? Yeah. Like no break? No break. <laughs> well, they'd shut them down to, you know, check oil and, you know, at the end of a shift and do, you know, integrity checks, right, but you know. Then right back to what? <laughs> yeah. So again, you know, and again, we did change, and again, the, the you know they did a good job at revising durability requirements. But I remember that as a as a young engineer, thinking, wow, that's you know pretty harsh. But um, I heard someone else talking about like the uh, the five fours were pretty borderline, you know, known for pinging at part you know part throttle, being pretty not insensitive. And they go, and someone asked the question, well, when is detonation bad, and why did these engines live? Well, one, it was not super heavy detonation you know, we used to call that we would set because you know detonation is also a function of the environmental conditions right mm. so if you're pulling in 100 degree air with that's dry versus 40 degree air that's wet they have two different borderline limits so when we would run that test the operator would have to listen for incipient or borderline just you know just starting to ping detonation that's the way that we would set it mm. you know where a customer you know might might just barely pick it up, mm. but uh, so so you know. Though, but now you know the durability tests. You try to combine them, and you know. So again, less testing, but getting the same results. But uh, yeah, I mean, they, they have some pretty stringent durability requirements to make them, so you can still give that warranty and have them live a long time. Yeah, I mean, and even to this day, I mean, uh, you know, the Bronco Raptor isn't tunable at least easily. Um, 
the F-150, 21 and newer wasn't. Obviously, mm. the aftermarket is inventive at times and they've mm. found ways around that. And I think that's the newest locking is more related to over there updates to mm. the vehicles and uh, related to them updating the vehicle, you know, you used to have to go to Ford and right. there's a new program and they're going to load it. They're doing that stuff over, over the air now, over the internet. And I can see why they would have to lock it down at that point. Cause there could be conflicts, right? Like, Oh, I have a tune on my vehicle. And now all of a sudden they're updating something on the vehicle. Who knows what's going to happen? Right. You know, so, or, or, you know, as, you know, as you say, or, you know, somebody, you know, trying to do something bad, like mm. can get into your vehicle over the air and all of a sudden say, why don't throttle, right? Command that. Yeah, they did. Computer. Yeah. They did a, a story on that on one of the news shows of taking mm. over somebody's vehicle and all, and all that. And, uh, so yeah, the, the t technology brings a lot of benefits, but it also brings a lot of pitfalls with maybe mm. being able to control that vehicle. But for the most part, well, they locked down the they locked down the F one hundred and fifty in twenty twenty one, but a twenty twenty three Mustang is still good to go. Mm -hmm. Now, is the twenty twenty four going to be locked down? Probably, I would guess. Uh, you know, it, maybe it, in the same way as a F one hundred and fifty that we can get around it. I don't know. Yeah, they, yeah, I, I don't know. Again, yeah. being gone so long, I'm not sure what what they're doing. But chances are, if it does have over there updates, you know, I would think the security you know team at Ford, you know, worrying about what could go wrong. The failure mode and effect analysis would say mm -hmm. we got to lock it because you know we don't know if it's accessible via wi-fi what you know people can can get in right they can go in and get into your bank account right i mean yeah. these, the, the hackers are really really smart right. smart doesn't equal good people but smart people you know can do bad things at times yeah i mean and whenever you release a new technology you feel like you know all the possible pitfalls of it but you have no idea until it gets out in the wild and how inventive people are going to be like mm -hmm. did ford predict that uh you know they would find a way around doing the f-150 21 plus who knows right mm -hmm. they maybe they knew like well they'll eventually figure it out but we're just going to make it more difficult for them or do they is somebody sitting there going I can't believe they figured it out. You know, yeah. they, they beat us again. I doubt that's the case. Uh, uh, and sometimes I wonder if, uh, you know, they make it difficult but not impossible to get around, whereas other platforms are employing a much more difficult, you know what I mean? Like with the F-150, for instance, there's a box and you go under the hood and you plug direct, you're basically like bench flashing the PCM, mm -hmm. right? You, you know, Ford had to leave a door open for that, in my opinion. Maybe not on purpose. Whereas you take a new, um, you know, the Corvette C8. That's still not a solution, right? If that was a solution for Corvette C8, somebody would have done that by now. They just now released a solution for that, but it requires physically modifying the PCM, which is, of course, a little bit concerning, you know, when you're sending out your brand new PCM uh, to HP Tuners, for instance, whereas uh, with the F-150, you don't have to modify anything. You know what I mean? So in my mm -hmm. mind, and maybe I'm a little bit of a conspiracy theorist, mm -hmm. but I go, I wonder if Ford like, thinks about mm -hmm. that at all, or they just didn't really care if it was impenetrable as, say, uh, mm -hmm. GM and Dodge are doing. You know? Yeah, and it, it, you know, I don't know. Yeah, because yeah, yeah. Yeah, just again, you know, I was last time I was in controls and calibration proper was 08. Yeah. So yeah, that was so a long time long before time, any yeah. of this stuff was really even being discussed, I'm sure. Yeah. Um, I guess it's just part of it is me just being a little bit romantic of being a <laughs> Ford guy. Like, Ford's looking out for us, and they're making it you know, easier on us than everybody else. And maybe that's by chance. Maybe that's by design. I don't know. Um, I wanted to talk a little bit more specifically about uh, your race car now <laughs> with the Godzilla. Um, I'm sure a lot of people have seen pictures of it on the internet. I mean, it's mm. a full out serious race car. Um, I believe you were building it for ultra street, you know, like, like a mid to high four second type ET, I would think somewhere in there in the eighth mile, of course. Yes. Uh, but you mentioned to me that you're, uh, going to upgrade the blower and, uh, really go for it. What's what's the current configuration of the car and plan with the car? Yeah. Yeah. It's a little bit of a sore point because this is a bad side, you know, good side, bad side of like, you know, having customers is, you know, the car has basically been ready to go for over six weeks, mm -hmm. but I haven't, I need like a day and a half with the car because I, you know, it's got oil in it and got water in it. 
it just doesn't have fuel. In, no, it doesn't have. Yeah, it just doesn't have fuel or trans fluid in it. Mm. And then I need to take it out uh, with Jason and Patrick available, you know, to test it. And I haven't had the time because mm. I've got some customer stuff that I just need to address and, and get out. Um, but that being said, um, you know, the plan was to go at Alter Street. There was supposed to be a crankshaft available last year, then beginning of this year, and then in January when I didn't have it, I got a, couldn't get a clean answer. I just said, heck with it. I got to work with what I can. And, you know, to me, part about keeping the excitement around Godzilla is doing cool things with it. So I think everyone's seen, you know, what Cletus McFarland's done with, mm. with his, which has been super cool. Uh, the sick week type drive, yep. and he's gone, you know, 750 with it. Uh, I think 750s. Yeah. And um, I think there's more in there. So our goal with this car is we went from a, uh, we went 461 or 464 at 161 to the eighth with an F1A 91 blower on it. So smaller pro charger. Mm -hmm. And uh, so what we did was we put an F3D 106 on it, which is kind of an X275 size blower mm -hmm. and put a fresh engine engine, a fresh engine in it. So same basically I had, except we dry decked the heads, put copper head gaskets on it, just because no one's done it yet. And I kind of want to know what's involved with doing that. And uh, so that's ready to go. And the goal with that is to run a six second quarter mile. So again, um, until I can get a ultra street legal cubic inch motor, because the maximum cubic inches in ultra street is 440, stock Godzilla is 445. Jeez. And, uh, you know, some people really want to go after NMC or, you know, Don, John Sears and say, well, you know, let this in. I'm going, there's probably not a car out there with the exception of the guys that are running Coyotes that have a stock crank in it. I don't even right. know if the Coyote guys do, but I assume they do. Um, so why should I be special and not need to buy a crankshaft? Right. I mean, I'm, I, I'm always of the opinion, if I want to go play somebody else's game, the first thing you don't do is ask them to change the rules for you. Right, right. You know, you go in, you do the best you can in their rules, and then see where the cards fall. So um, I'm, I'm pretty passionate that way. I mean, I, I get it. And um, so until we get that worked out where I can get a, a legal engine, we're going to go run... I'll try to run a six second quarter mile. Now at my age, uh, I'm not anxious to go any, I mean, this is a stock firewall, stock floor pan, even though it's a 60 cert car, you know, I'm not anxious to go, you know, 200 miles in at a bunch of passes. I just want to, I think that, set, set the bar and yeah. And then yeah. let other people yep. improve on it. Right. As they will. Um, but I think it's kind of, you know, cool if you have a car with a stock cylinder block that came in a truck, mm. stock crankshaft that came in a truck, stock cylinder heads that came in a truck starting to talk like a coyote guy now. yeah <laughs> and uh and can go you know and it can run a six second quarter mile in a car that got stock floor pans and stock firewall and stock style rear suspension of course it's not the stock uh, torque box on there but they're all in the stock locations that'd be pretty cool mm. and uh i coined i coined this phrase i said i coined it i stole it from a guy named greg kazel who used to, i was one of my mentors when i was a young engineer he raced a uh and altered with a six-cylinder Ford in it, mm. um, a 306. And he goes, it's just an old Ford with a truck motor. So mm -hmm. now I say, my Fox Body Mustang is just an old Ford with a truck motor. So I think if we could do that, it'd be pretty cool. I don't know if it'd be successful, but we're going to try. If you had to estimate uh, with that blower at full tilt or as hard mm. as you plan on running it, like what kind of power are we talking, you think? 18, maybe. Again, because yeah. you're still running through the stock cylinder head, yep. you know, and well, it's still a stock head, you know? Yeah. Well, that's, I actually, that, that was a perfect segue because I wanted to go there next. Now, I'm a coyote guy. Hmm. The chance of there being an aftermarket coyote head is zero, I'd say, because hmm. it's a great There's some head. billet ones, aren't there? Uh, heads? There might, I don't like know does if Does MMR do a billet head? No. They might do one now. It's a newer thing. Okay. Uh, they do the block. They might do the heads. But for the most part, Mm -hmm. You're not going to see a street right. aftermarket coyote head, whereas you go to the 5.0 market, how many different cylinder heads are there? Mm -hmm. Do you foresee uh, the aftermarket uh, grabbing onto the Godzilla in the same way? And like, you know, like, like you said, you're saying, you know, we're limited by the head. Okay, mm -hmm. so, you know, how much of a step forward would it be if somebody decided to do a head for that? Do you think mm -hmm. it's a pretty significant jump or just everything is just a little improvement from there i think you know depending on depending on who does the cylinder head and what their goals are right because 
the thing about the aftermarket, there's a couple different customers, right? So if you want to go after the race customer, mm. like to me, for every guy that's building a car like this Mustang, you know, that's you want to run, you know, six ninety nine at uh. one ninety five to two oh two miles an hour, there's probably a hundred and fifty guys that just would be super tickled with a seven hundred and fifty horsepower in a street car. Right. So I would say um, I think there's a really good market for a good cylinder head that will make in the 750 to 800 horsepower bolt-on type range uh, with it. Um, and I think with the architecture of it, I think there'll also be other a market for someone that wants to build a competition head, like an like an SC1 head or mm. uh, a Pro King inline head that you know for the small block Ford. Um, so I think those you'll see those coming mm. um, probably in the next 12-ish, 18 months, I think. Yeah. I, I think um, because the Godzilla, even though it's not going into a car, um, you know, I think the capacity is probably 250 to 300 and some thousand units a year, mm. you know, and they're going to end up in junkyards. They're going to end up, you know, coming out of the Amazon vehicles. And because it's a nice package, it's large cubic inches, um, even though it's a small block. And again, I believe it's a small block and we can talk about that. Um, and it doesn't really matter because all it matters, you know, only matters to the sanctioning bodies. Right. But um, uh, I think it's going to really, you know, do extremely well mm. um, because, you know, we, you know, with uh, I kind of limit when I build an engine for a customer to. If you want to keep stock rods and pistons, I want to keep you to about 62, 6,300. It's mm -hmm. a hyper eutectic cast piston mm -hmm. with a powdered metal rod with a 422 bore. Mm -hmm. Let, let's not, you know, I'm not the guy, I'm too old to want to be washing my dyno cell out after I, you know, scatter a motor. So um, I kind of limit it to that. And we've, you know, 620, 640 horsepower, you know, pretty, you know, I'm pretty mm -hmm. good with that. Um, but then, you know, if you want to put pistons and rods in, okay, now we can spin at 7,500. You know, I think, you know, even with the stock head, I think with some of the cams that we're working on, we're going to see like, you know, seven and a quarter, 750 horsepower. That's awesome. So, yeah, your, your opinion on the stock uh, rotating assembly has gotten me like a little worried on my truck. I mean, in the business I'm in, if it blows up, it's not as bad as like a normal person because I'm mm -hmm. doing R and D and everything. But of course, I don't want anything to blow up. Uh, but you know, my truck has a camshaft that you spec'd out, the heads, and then of course the Whipple on it and full exhaust. And mm -hmm. I think all that helps also helps yep. it live a little longer, the camshaft probably and, mm -hmm. the, and, the, and the better exhaust. But I mean, I beat the snot out of that thing. What do you shift at? Uh, like probably like 6,800 or so. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. It's, I'm put, well, th that's mm -hmm. why that, that's what I'm talking about yeah. when you, that's why you scared me because, mm -hmm. Uh, you know, I'm a coyote guy. So like, if it's not 8,000, it's low, it's <laughs> low, it's, it's too low. Uh, so, you know, I was spending it even higher than that, I think. And then you, uh, you know, you, you had mentioned something to me. I didn't ask you, but just in conversation, it came up as far as like, yeah, I wouldn't go above 65. And I'm like, uh, <laughs> I'm going like seven or 800 above that. So I should probably bring it down a little bit. Uh, but it's been phenomenal. I mean, I, I haven't had any problems with that vehicle, even the normal, problems like the spark plug wires where people mm. have issues with those and maybe that's because i have an aftermarket exhaust on it and you know maybe mm. things are staying cooler in that area a little bit i don't really know uh but it's been extremely reliable for me and uh uh, you know, I absolutely love it. And I see a huge potential in there much more than I saw when I first bought the truck. I bought mm -hmm. the truck on a whim, like, Hey, mm -hmm. this is great. Nobody knows anything about this engine. Uh, mm -hmm. maybe it's going to be the, the next LS, you know, mm -hmm. like everybody wants one. That's, that was my idea. And I'm sure that's, you know, crossed your mind too. Um, but you know, even right now, trying to think about what's going to happen in the future, the one way to really give yourself some perspective, which is, means you don't really have any clue, is like when the Coyote came out. I remember when the Coyote came out. Everybody flipped out in a negative way. Like, 11 to 1 compression before we actually mm -hmm. had them, right? Well, oh, that's going to kill, kill it. You can't put boost to that. No way that's going to work. And, you know... It's going to be one of the mm -hmm. baddest NA engines, but we all put boost on these cars, so really, it's a step back. Mm -hmm. I remember that being a conversation in the beginning, and I'm just like, 
I, I can't, I'm not going to claim that I didn't agree with that. I wasn't on either side. Uh, but to see where that has come, I mean, we just did a GT350, which is way higher compression than the initial Coyote on pump gas and made 800 wheel horsepower with a Whipple, you know, and that's common, mm -hmm. right? you know, and to think that you could have done that one way and you couldn't have done that with a Gen 1 Coyote, of course, but to see that how that has progressed, it makes me extremely excited about the Godzilla because we're mm -hmm. already at a really good point. I mean, mm -hmm. I did, you know, I wish I knew this better off the top of my head, but uh, the the progress that you made on the Godzilla from inception to going mm -hmm. fast with it is either equal to or faster than anybody really probably did with the Coyote. You know, I'm mm -hmm. guessing uh, from the very beginning. C could be, yeah, uh, or, probably close. Or at least close, yeah. right? I think a lot of people, would never have uh, predicted when the 7.3 came out that you would be doing what you're doing with it, not just now, but even when, you know, whenever you first started going fast in the Fox body. Um, but th that, the next question is beyond the heads, we're, like so like on a Coyote, you know, we can make up to say 1,800, 2,000 horsepower, and no matter what you do to the block, it starts becoming questionable, right? Mm -hmm. So do you see similar, you know, power limits on, on that engine? Like before you would have to maybe go to a, like, you know, obviously we're mm. just talking about full on race stuff at this point. So, you know, or is that block going to give up? Well, you're, you've got mm. a stock block in your car yes. and you're hoping to make 1800. So that kind of answers that you think it could go up to there. Mm. Uh, but is there anything about that architecture that you see as a smoking gun of a limit? Yeah. yeah, the thing, the, again, this is like, oh, that's all right. Uh, you know, where you, where I where, wish I was still at Ford Performance, right? Because I think the, the block is really good. If I could make two changes, right, I would have a team of engineers go to the casting plant and make the bores thicker. So, and I would eliminate the saw cut between the bores. I think if you did that, um, it would be, I, I don't know where, the, I think the limit would be very, very high because that block is, is, is very good. Mm -hmm. And um, I think those would be the two errors. That way you could go to like a four and a quarter, four, you know, 4.25, 4.27 bore. Don't have to worry about the bridge anymore because now what I do with the bridge, like on this motor, is I, uh, I originally wanted to weld, you know, down the center of it. And there's a guy in Michigan named Chris Razor, probably... I guarantee you there's not a better welder on the planet. I hate to say the guy's the best because, you know, you're insulting everybody else, but he is like a genius of the welding. Mm -hmm. And I called him and I said, Chris, I'd like to tell you to weld the, that up for me. He goes, won't live, won't do it. Uh, okay. And again, it's talking, you know, again, the team, your mm -hmm. circle, knowing people. So I said, well, if he can't do it, he knows what he's talking about. So if someone else can try it, I'm not going to. So what we did is I, you, you start to look at that saw cut and it really only goes down about three quarters of an inch. It's a, it's a, it's a radius, yeah. you know? So I said, okay, what else can we do? So we took uh, Dave Zimmerman, uh, made for me these kind of like little half moons that we slide into there uh -huh. and tap them in. So they're kind of a press fit. So at the top of the bore, you don't get this deflection if, if possible, because it's just a small part of the bore. Because so what you're worried about is that Did bore wiggling a little bit. So I figured, well, if, I, if we wedge that in there, maybe it'll stop. So on this engine that's... In the car now, we did that with the block filled. It's going to be a run on M1 with the copperhead gasket with the dry deck. Mm -hmm. uh, so we'll see how that works out. And until we run it, we don't know for sure. I'm a little nervous on the head mm -hmm. because it's got so much water in it. But we'll, we'll see. Uh, what is the uh, purpose? I remember when I was up at your uh, your shop, you were mm -hmm. showing that to me, mm -hmm. the saw cut. And we were mm -hmm. talking about that. I think you actually mm -hmm. told me that story at that time. What, what's the saw cut there for? It's for cooling. Okay. Yes, so you have to get some uh, more coolant, uh, you know, flow uh, in the critical areas. Gotcha, gotcha. And in your, if you just had to guess, is, you know, like something like that from an engineering perspective, is that one of those things that could have been left out and probably been fine, or you think it's actually important? I mean, I know I, you don't know I, exactly, I don't know. but if you had to guess, like, you know what I mean? Like, that's the one thing when I see things like that, I go, man. 
Well, here's they we, really need that. Yeah. <laughs> you know? So, so as, as I mentioned, I left Ford at the end of seventeen. So right. engine was designed, the program was approved. It mm. went through what's called PA. So all the money was allocated. So no chance of really canceling it. Mm. That's when I retired, and it came out as you know, and you know, uh, you know, in production and, and you know, pre-production out of the plant, you know, uh, in uh, nineteen. But um, if I would have been there a bit longer, I was okay. Now I've got durability proven. Take the saw cut out and run the same durability along with the vehicle durability mm. and prove to me that we lose the head gaskets without it, mm. um, which would have you know, been insulting to the team. But sometimes, like I said, you want to trust your team. It doesn't mean you don't challenge your team, right? Yep. So that's probably what I would have done because I, I don't know definitively, right? So how do you know definitively? Go yeah. run the test. Go to test it. Yeah. So, and I know, again, I have asked you a few of these questions and I'm just asking for mm. you to guess. Uh, you know, Ford uh, Performance has released specialty blocks over the years, mm -hmm. right? Uh, that were never in a production vehicle. Is that even in the realm of possibility, you think, for a platform like that? Or it would take the right person to push for it? I think it's probably in the realm of possibilities, but I think anybody that's been reading the news has known how Ford is really cutting back, cutting back, cutting back. And we started to talk about Ford Performance a little bit, and I didn't kind of finish that story. So... Ford Performance, when I was there, I had, you know, the, the, the two elements of mm. it, and uh, which was the performance parts and the racing, and the vehicles were under a guy named Herman Solenbeck in PD. So one of the things, and I gave, you know, Raj a, a lot of credit for, I think, the way the GT500 and Jim Farley way it is, but one of the things they did was when they moved the performance vehicles from marketing, uh, the racing support, from mm. marketing to product development, um, it left the Ford performance parts being part of vehicle personalization in Ford customer service division. So I don't know this, but my impression from how long some of the stuff is taking, like the Megazilla, where it mm. looks like it was pretty ready to go, but we haven't seen it yet, although the intake has now been released, which is awesome. I did see that. Yep. But um, I'm kind of thinking that they probably cut their engineering staff. So will it, you know, I don't know if they will have the resources to make that happen anytime yeah. soon. Yeah. Um, I did hear they, they cut a lot of staff there was the yeah. rumor I heard. Yeah, but again, you know, it's one of those things like, and, and because there's so much going on in Ford right now, I mean, to be open, it's something where like the cylinder block supervisor, without anybody knowing, could say, hey, you know, Ford performance guy, if I went and got like 50 blocks and I sent my guys down there to rub the cores for you and you sent them to the plant and we did a special run where we didn't machine it. Do you want them? It could happen at that level. Yeah. But I think it's so intense now at Ford. I, it's not I don't, the right time for it's it. Not, it's going to be very, it's going to take somebody very courageous to yeah. kind of go do it. Like when we did the Cobra Jets, for example, mm -hmm. I was a director, so I was a pretty high level. But my boss, I had to work for her directly, didn't even know we did it until they were all delivered. You know? That's crazy. Yeah. Well, you know, and I think the first fi that was an 08, the first fifty. That is not yeah, yeah. right. And and I I think that could also be due to the environment, uh, mm -hmm. you know, uh, economic, political, all those sorts of things. You know, it's just our general hope of the future versus mm -hmm. being cautious. Like, mm -hmm. what's going to happen? Right. You know, you do. Everybody does that personally with your own finances. Businesses have to do that. So in today's, you know, today talking about that, I see what you're saying. But, you know, I'm being hopeful that, you know, things change over time. And, you know, I my biggest fear with, you know, and I love this business, obviously, I, I didn't I'm not like you. I didn't start out as a car guy. Mm. I was a computer guy and got into cars because I could afford the Mustang, you know, which wasn't expensive, but for me it was at the time. Like, God, I could buy a Mustang. Look at that. That's cool looking. I wasn't really into the performance side of it. And then mm -hmm. it just completely has taken over my life. And I realized that I was in a very sweet spot. Maybe everybody thinks that, but maybe not of technology combined with automotive and still gasoline to where I fear in 20 years, I'll be telling people like, you have no idea how good it was back in the, you know, early 2000s. And like, we had all this stuff and now you guys all drive the same exact thing. Yeah, they're fast, but they have no soul. You don't know anything about it. You know, uh, I, I fear that just the same way 
when maybe I don't remember this a ton, but maybe like in the late '80s, everybody would talk about like the muscle car era, and then the whole downfall of that with fuel economy and then the cars just all were kind of really crappy for a while and then now this is almost like a resurgence of that same gearhead mindset uh with a whole huge helping of technology on top of it that is like quadrupled the performance of the muscle car era so you know i just really fear that that's where things are headed again and i want to do everything i can to stop that you know yeah well first yeah I, you, you said a lot there that i would really like to comment on if i could um you know first um i like your first i like your optimism as mm. opposed to the fear i hope your optimism proves uh to be the future um as far as it'll get better again mm -hmm. um i want to go back to muscle cars right so you know, as I mentioned, you know, I was born in 1960. So the muscle car era was when I was a little kid. Mm -hmm. And then we got into emissions and, you know, 460 cubic inches, inch engines making 140 horsepower <laughs> with, you know, meeting emissions. And, you know, I remember telling my mom, my brother, man, I was born 10 years too late, you know, and, you know, when I was a teenager and, you know, um, you know, in the, you know, through, you know, the end of the 19, you know, uh, you know, uh, you know, to my teens and then, you know, into my uh, early 20s. But then the five liter Mustang came out and it was like, I was born at the exact right time. Right. And I want, you know, younger folks thinking this or hoping that they're born at the exact right time because hopefully the future will be as you hope it is. But I do want to go back to my little Jim Clark story on the Fox body Mustang. So the five liter Mustang, I think people can say was pretty instrumental to the modern muscle car era. And what happened was, you know, the Mustang was revised in 1979. The five liter was in it in 79 with a whopping 130 horsepower, I believe, Oof. with a single rod overdrive, three speed with four year overdrive. I owned one of those. I broke seven transmissions and three rear ends in that car. And, but again, then I think they took the five liter out of it. In fact, they know they took the five liter out of it. And then they had the turbo four in there, you may remember. Yep. And the sales were kind of going down and marketing was wondering what they're going to do. And there was a guy named Jim Clark and he was the manager of the five liter group. And he went to Dave Hagen, who was several levels above him, who was the, what my equivalent was when I retired, uh, running. Well, in fact, he wasn't because he only had North American engines. I had global, but he was a director at that time. And he said, let me put the five liter back in the Mustang. You know, and the marketing guy said, well, you know, I don't know. We may self get a 5% mix, you know, but maybe it'll be something to stimulate it if we can do it cheap enough. But back in that time, Jim had the calibrators. He had the dyno development group. He had the component engineers and what was called the systems guys, okay? Mm -hmm. So he owned the entire, if you will, path from engineering to production because he had the certification mm. and you know the the design and the development and this was in 19 i think it was either late 80 or the beginning 81 and this was an 82 car so this wow. is unheard of right so he goes with his team and you know he gets them all motivated and jim was he, he and is today he's still around um super confident man, super motivated, and wanted to have an impact. So he said, uh, you know, let me put it back in. And, you know, so he kind of got people behind it a little bit. So they put the five liter back in. But it wasn't the 130 horsepower five liter that came out the car in 79. He wanted to do an HO. So he told his team, you can put anything in that engine you want as long as it's already been validated in another application. So um, that's where the cam came in, which was a little different than the previous cam and the dual snorkel air cleaner. And, you know, Jim tells a story about how these old guys, you know, which, you know, were younger than I am now, you know, were excited about these little bits and pieces that they could that they could do. And uh, so the boss found out this Dave Hagen that was multiple levels above him, calls him in his office and Clark, I hear you're doing an HO version of this thing. He goes, yes, sir, we are. He goes, God damn it, Clark. You know, you better not screw this up. If this thing tanks, it's on you. You're on your own. In fact, 
don't even do it. Just stop. So he gets out of this meeting, getting his you know ass chewed out, and he goes back to the team and goes, "How'd it go with Dave?" He goes, "He is super excited about this. <laughs> we've got you know we've got to deliver you know, and just got everybody pumped up you know." And he didn't he didn't change course. But one of the things he did do was the torque curve, the single route overdrive, which was in it in '82, um, made more torque than the transmission could handle. So my friend of mine, Greg Kazel, who was a base engine development engineer took the torque curve and Jim, there's a problem. See, torque curve looks like this and we go up here and we exceed the transmission torque so they're not gonna sign off. And Jim goes to Greg and this is when we had no data acquisition, everything, the dyno sheets were all handwritten. He goes, no Greg, you're looking at that curve wrong. See, it, it goes like this and it peaks here and then goes straight across till we get to there and then it comes back down. Greg being the astute guy says, yeah, Jim, you're right. Let me get that corrected. <laughs> and that was the official curve, so how they were able to, to release it. And, uh, and then uh, I think two months after it was announced, it was 50% of the mix oh, wow. on the Mustang. So super, super successful. And then Jim tells the story when he got called back into uh, Hagen's office. He goes, uh, well, Clark, you were right. You know, and this guy didn't like to admit he was wrong. So here's another million. I don't know what you did or how you did, but here's another million dollars to your budget next year. Keep doing what you're doing. So wow. that's how it had all the uh, iterations after that. Well, that's that's amazing. And you know, again, it, it just goes back to what I had mentioned with you with the Godzilla, and you know, we've talked about it a lot. Which is, it's so amazing how, I mean. The Fo I mean, what would we be without a Fox Body Mustang? Yet right. there was just one guy that it was in total mm -hmm. control of that happening, it sounds like to me, based on your story. A absolutely. Yep. Yeah. And, you know, put everything on the line. And, yeah. He, 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 if he, he got fired, he didn't care. He, and he, he ignored know, he goes, an order to stop doing it, you know, mm -hmm. which obviously he... It takes somebody with a vision like that to go, I know, I feel so strongly about this that I'm willing to risk my career, or at least at this particular place, to prove to you that this is the way to go. Yep. And I think that's often, and it's not always that way, right? Like you mm -hmm. can't just go, hey, I'm gonna go against the grain all the time and I'm gonna be successful all the time. A lot of times you're not, but you know, and it doesn't have to be cars. You can use that example across all industry, right? Yep. You, know, uh, you know, Elon Musk is a good example. Who would have mm -hmm. ever thought that you'd have a company building spaceships right. like a private company right is he doing that no but he's the right guy to make it happen obviously right maybe there's a guy under him that's more critical than him but he's at the top and he's the one that made it happen and you know that story is everywhere and it makes me excited about the human race that it's like we're not all like the same you know right. there's so much value in every individual person and their ideas and the people that rise to the top are the ones that determine what everybody else experiences right like that guy mm -hmm. is is responsible for like if that never happened what would have happened with the mustang in general it might have just been like a, a mercury cougar right? <laughs> you know it's gone it could well you know though at one point in time i mean I don't remember what year it was, but the Mustang was going to be replaced. The probe, remember the Ford probe? I do. Yeah, I do. I, do. Yeah. I, I, I always never knew that was a hundred. I heard that as a rumor. Well, that, well, what happened was is that they had the car and the probe, and Don Patterson, or was it Peterson? But he was the CEO at the time. He drove the car, you know, and they said, you know, what do you think? He goes, nice car. This is not a Mustang, though. Mm. And the and that's that that. It, is what happened. Yeah. And uh, so that's why they named it Probe and kept the Mustang. That's, that's amazing. Um, if you had to uh, really look back and, you know, I have you here because mm -hmm. you're an inspiration to me and all the people mm -hmm. that have been helpful to me. Mm -hmm. it, it, do you have anybody that was like super instrumental in you in your path? Yeah that you yeah. want to even talk about or mention. Yeah, well, obviously, you know, my, my you know, dad, my brother, obviously, you know, big in the cars in the, in, in the start. And then, you know, from uh, high school drafting, you know, mm -hmm. teacher who had a lot of confidence in me where I got my first job that allowed me to work my way through college, Bill Burton. Um, I was a 
pretty crappy student until, you know, like 10th grade. And I had this cool uh, math teacher that, you know, made math interesting. And from his class through my graduate studies, I never got anything other than an A in math after, Mm -hmm. you know, just the motivation I got from him, uh, Ben Courtright. Um, Then at Ford, there were so many. I mean, this guy named Bob Stein, um, he's, uh, he, you know, he was my mentor, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, he is, you know, a super smart engine development or MIT grad, but a farm boy, you know, he used to talk about, you know, he had to go to school, smell like shit because he had to clean the, <laughs> you know, milk the cows in the morning, but he ended up, you know, went to MIT and, um, but, you know, he's really good with combustion analysis and engine development and so um, humble, you know, right. and answering questions and always taking time for you. Of course, Jim Clark, who I mentioned, um, so, you know, yeah, just a variety, and I know I left a bunch of folks out. Yeah, that's, that's always helped, a tough question because you yeah. don't want to leave anybody out. But, but there's a ton. I want to circle back to what you just, before we wrap things up, because I think this is super important to talk about, is, yes, you were a car guy growing up, your family. Yes, you went to school. But, like, I know a lot of people that come to me all the time that say, hey, I want to get into this business. How do I do it? How do I make that first step? And obviously my path was totally different. I went to college, but for a totally different thing. I'm more of a enthusiast turned professional type of thing where you're a professional that is also an enthusiast. So where was that spot where it was clear to you that that was your path? Like, was it college that like put, like what was your first real job in, in this industry? Well, first job was at Ford, right? Again, it was it was real simple because I wanted to work for Ford. Mm-hmm. And my brothers got, grew up with a guy that he used to street race with named John Coletti. Okay. And, you know, so um, when uh, John graduated from Wayne State, he hired into Ford. So when my brother said, hey, Brian wants to work for Ford and he's a real good draftsman, you know, what, what would his path be? He said, he's never going to get in here as a draftsman. We, you know, he needs an engineering degree. And uh, so that's when I decided to, uh, you know, go to school to get an engineering degree so I could work for Ford. Right. I, mean, I mean, it was that So instead of going to school and deciding what I'm going to do, you decided, here's what I'm going to do. How do I get there? Yes. Yeah. And that's how I answer uh, the question when people ask me. Uh, unfortunately, there's really no school for uh stock computer calibration in the aftermarket because it's kind of like a a very niche thing and you know there you you can't get a a book you know nothing's Mm -hmm. documented it's kind of like hacking really Mm -hmm. i mean not necessarily uh most tuners don't do their own hacking the software Mm -hmm. company does the hacking and Mm -hmm. opens the tables but it's i call it almost like it's never going to be a science. It's always going to be a little bit of voodoo, what I do, Mm -hmm. because we don't have access to all the proper information. We don't have access to all the tables. Uh, But the answer is still the same, right? If you want to do this, you have to do what it takes to get to this point. And the only way to do that is get a car, get the software, and learn how to do it on your own. Because if you can't motivate yourself to learn the simplest things to get to that point, to come to me and ask a real question, not how do I get into tuning, but Mm -hmm. hey, it's at idle and here's the timings at this and this is happening and then all of a sudden it stalls. You know, if you can't get to that point before, you know, on your own, then you don't really wanna do it, is what I tell people. I go, you might be in love with the idea of being involved in cars, but if, if you don't find yourself researching the software and like watching YouTube videos about it or whatever, you know, the way you learn and your only question is, how do I do this? Then you've already answered that question. In my opinion, you, you shouldn't mm-hmm. be doing this because you haven't put any effort into learning it organically, you know? So that's what you did is you went back and learned mm-hmm. what you needed to learn to get to that point. Yeah. And it would be, you know, I think open, you know, probably what I did was easier Right, Mm -hmm. because it says, well, you know, I wanted to work at Ford Mm -hmm. was my goal, Mm -hmm. and to be able to work at Ford, I needed to get an engineering degree. Mm -hmm. So once you, you know, uh, and I was fortunate enough to have a job where I made, I mean, in 1979 as a draftsman, I was a really good draftsman. I made ten dollars an hour in 1979. 
Mm-hmm. It was easy for me to pay for my own school and tuition. My parents, I stayed at my parents' house because I went to University of Michigan at Dearborn. But that was, and then I was, you know, I did real well at school, but I also worked really hard, you know. Yeah, you say it's easy, but you you worked really hard to become a draftsman to pay for it, and you didn't just get good enough grades to go to Ford magically. You know, you put the work in, of course. Right, but But it was a more direct, you know, it was a a more laid out path, I think, as opposed, you know, to to what, you know, because there was a, you know, there was an end. It's a path that you could say, if I want to do this and work hard enough, the roadmap's there. You didn't have to figure the roadmap out. You just had to go. I'm going to do it. I'm yeah, going to do I'm going to get on the road and yeah. yeah, we're going to do it. Yeah. But, um, but on the other hand, it might be a good business opportunity for you is, you know, there are other people that teach classes on how to tune Holly or yeah. all tech and that, and might be, uh, you know, people pay a lot of money for those classes. So you never know, yeah. Ken, it might be another, uh, yeah. I mean, <laughs> I've, uh, I have a background in, uh, not official teaching, but like when I, I went to school for video production and audio mm-hmm. production and I worked at the local cable public access TV thing mm-hmm. and we would teach you wanted to come in and mm-hmm. videotape your kid's mm-hmm. soccer game you would have to come in and I would teach you how to use the camera and I've, I've always loved instruction mm-hmm. um, and I've always thought about that and the thing that has always stopped me in the past mm-hmm. honestly was uh, self-doubt I guess you know mm-hmm. like okay I'm pretty good at this but like it's way different like if somebody hands you a puzzle Mm -hmm. To do it yourself might be somewhat intuitive, but to try to explain that to somebody else, Mm. like, here's how you think, you know, Mm. it's difficult. But as I've gotten older and, you know, gotten better at this and and more confident in my skills, you know, I do feel like I can do that. And I already do that here. You know, we have, uh, you know, new tuning people occasionally and I have a great staff here right now and they're they're absorbing things. And it's, it's actually reignited uh my love for the business and tuning because of that right Mm -hmm. because something that's very simple to me or very straightforward only because i've messed it up 20 times in the past Mm -hmm. somebody that doesn't know that at all and to talk to them about it and have them absorb it and 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 apply it and go wow i just learned this and thank you and i'm like i didn't know i did anything i just told you what i already knew you know what i mean so i find that very rewarding and you know i might wind up down that path someday Uh, the biggest issue with Mm -hmm. with charging to do say stock computer tuning versus holly is Mm -hmm. holly is fully documented Mm -hmm. and you could take a holly and make it like a college course because there's no unknowns Mm -hmm. in a holly right Right. they're going to tell you what every table does or how to make your tables but to this day every time a new platform comes out uh, there's so much to figure out and I couldn't do it myself, right? Mm-hmm. There's people like Jerry who was on our last podcast. Who's, you know, my mentor from tuning to this day. Um, he's helping me every other day with, with things like that. And it's because there's not that resource to go to, to go, Oh, mm-hmm. well, Hey, a new computer came out and they added all these new tables and they're different names yeah. and HP tuners hasn't defined them yet. And we have to find them and see what they do. And Hey, I just mm-hmm. modified my Godzilla truck. And when I went, what the throttle stayed open because mm-hmm. they got real aggressive with dash pot on the new trucks. And once you put the blower on, mm-hmm. it's going to kill you unless mm-hmm. you address it. So, you know, that's always the, the challenge of what I mm-hmm. do versus that is like, I could never fully answer every question. Yeah. But, well, you know, <laughs> you, you, you probably could, you know, better than most. And the only thing I always, you know, I learned from uh, of all people, somebody in real estate, when we were closing on a house and the other person was having some issues and it was mm-hmm. like, oh man, is this going to happen? And he said, we got a couple issues, but he always says, say, inch by inch, it's a cinch. Mm-hmm. So to me, with what you do, it might be, you say, well, what's a popular car that is tuned a lot? Like if it's a 2006, 15 to 2017 Mustang and all that is out there and you've done it many times. I mean, mm. that would be your one-on-one course, yep. right? This is already out. This is documented. And then your last, it'd be a five day course. And at your last two hours of the last day, you say, okay, now you know all this. Mm. However, the next advanced course is how do you interface with HP tuners on, you know, the next, you know, or on an unknown. And you, and then you walk through that. So yeah. I, I think, in bite-sized elements, you know, with all the work you guys have done here and how successful it's been and the reputation uh, of the business, I think it's, uh, 
it's very doable. Yeah. And again, you only, I mean, those guys, people pay a lot of money for those classes mm -hmm. and you only need five students, yep. you know, in a class to make it, I think, profitable. Yeah. And the way I look at it, uh, not necessarily like that I'm the most qualified to do it, but somebody has to do it. Right. The only reason I know what I know is because Jerry took me under his wing and taught me a lot of stuff and continues to mentor me. And I need to do the same to other people to keep the whole thing mm. going. Right. Because otherwise, over time, there'll just be a degradation of overall knowledge. And it's not like obviously everything comes through Jerry or me. There's mm. other people out there that know a lot, but it takes it takes those few key people to continue to pass that down, which, mm. you know, at the level you were working at happens on a more official educational level and then, you know, very specific job titles and passed down. But in my world, it's like more of an outlaw kind of oh, yeah. mentality. So it's a little hard to always wrap your head around like, you know, there's there's so much to learn on stock computer. You know, this came up, somebody asked me recently about uh, Holly, a friend of mine was building a car and he's putting a Holly on it and somebody else wound up tuning it or he's going to tune it. And, uh, he called me up and he's like, Hey man, I just saw the thing on Facebook and you tuned that car at NMRA with a Holly. I didn't know you did Holly. Mm -hmm. I go, dude, if I can tune a stock computer, I can tune a Holly. Like the only difference between tuning any standalone is understanding the architecture and how the log works. Mm -hmm. and, okay. I see the log. How do I apply that to the tune? But there's no nothing to figure out, right? Mm -hmm. There's directions for everything. Yep. I go, so if you think I'm a good stock computer tuner, I could do the Holly, you know, easier. Yeah. Because there's one fuel table, not, you know, one, this fuel table and 8,000 other modifiers, modifiers and, you know, and that have nothing to do with performance, right? It's for, for, for emissions reasons. And it's doing this on startup. Why, why does it sound like that on startup? Because the, it's got to get the cats hot, you know, that you don't even ha have anymore. No, they have the cats. Yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> but anyway, you know, yeah. so it's just all those things that make stock computer tuning, you know, very confusing. Uh, mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, and maybe that's the path forward is we may not even wind up with stock computers long term in these vehicles as, you know, all these regulations Mm -hmm. come down harder and harder on us and the computer's getting locked down you know we may be transitioning more to like a plug and play deal like Motec makes a kit for a lot of these Mustangs now that plug right in where the factory computer does with every single feature on the car running like on a GT500 everything mm -hmm. works you know so that's kind of the absolute ultimate version of what I do because Holly uh, you know you can't really put a Holly in a GT500 and get the launch control to work and the dash and it right. easily whereas Motec has gone that extra level and just you plug it in and you if I if you mm. drive one of these cars you don't even know it has a Motec in it everything works exactly as intended mm. unless you want to modify it mm. like to work better so you know that's that's really the big thing so speaking of that and handing down that type of knowledge do you how do you like do you feel like I know you do all these videos with Evan mm -hmm. is I know you're trying to promote the seven three in general, but like do you like teaching people like is that important mm -hmm. to you like do you you know I know like in your business like do you do that all yourself is your your son involved in it like mm -hmm. do you feel like there's something that you need to hand off to like the next generation like how do you handle that yeah and I think the thing is with the engine stuff mm -hmm. it's a bit easier right because mm -hmm. you know you take a 1966 289 and a godzilla right i mean they got they mm -hmm. got cranks cams rods pistons right and there's there's you know there yeah there's a few little idiosyncrasies that we try to talk about um but it's you know it's, it's very very you know there's why well, there's new technologies in there, whether it's VCT or direct injection, some of those things that, depending on the engines you know they have, is still an engine. Right. But we do. That's why we do like to do the videos to explain how to do things, whether it's a cam swap or some of the other stuff we do. Just not that there's anything special about it, but because of the lifter tray and maybe the possibility of dropping a lifter into the valley, mm. some of the things you can do to make it you know to overcome the hurdles. Right. Uh, so I think, uh, you know, with that regard, um, 
uh, you know, I, I try to use the videos as a way to, you know, transmit that information. And, you know, um, I, I think I mentioned I'm going to, you know, cut back on engine builds for customers mm-hmm. and focus a little bit more on some development work and maybe, you know, putting a, you know, a how-to book together. Yeah. You know, so it's, you know, documented for people yeah. on the Godzilla. I think that would be super helpful for you to pull all that stuff together and even, mm-hmm. you know, working with somebody on it like back in the day on the modular motor and it may have not been gospel but i believe mohovitz or somebody mm. did like a a book on on the modular stuff yep. you know and at least gave you something to look at and it was pretty accurate you know uh so you know i think that takes somebody like you that's the godzilla guy to document all that and you're doing that with the videos and people don't understand how much work goes into some of those videos. You know, I know it's Evan's channel, but you're mm-hmm. still there doing all the work. You know, we got to say mm-hmm. this, let's talk about this. Let's not forget that. It's way mm-hmm. more involved than people might think. It's not difficult, like, you know, mm-hmm. digging a ditch or something, there, but it's just, there's a lot of thought that goes into it. And people don't understand how long people are going to be watching those videos. Like my mm-hmm. most popular video on my YouTube channel uh, as far as uh, no, well, that's my biggest uh, views mm-hmm. as far as, uh, but that's like a time sensitive thing. And right. New Corvettes out, but to this day, the most hours viewed on a video, mm-hmm. and one of my most profitable videos is the camshaft swap in my truck, and mm-hmm. it's because I didn't just stand there and go, "Hey, I'm going to put a cam in." All right, it's in. Now I'm going to do that. We showed every step. All right, yeah. now we're going to torque the heads. Now we're going to, you know, and it's, I'm like thinking about it. I'm like, why is so many people watching this video? I go, because they want to know how to do it. Like, yeah. is there that many people uh, putting a cam in a 250 right now? Probably not. But there's people that want to, mm-hmm. right? So they want to watch it and learn. And then when they get to that point, they're ready to go. And that's, I do that all the time, whether it's computer stuff or videography or anything. Mm-hmm. I, you know, I consume a lot of YouTube videos uh, on on learning how to do things, it's, it's the easiest way to learn for me is watching somebody else do it. Even if mm-hmm. you know you're like, oh, it's it's not a big deal. Well, it's not a big deal to you, but for the guy that's never bolted a set of cylinder heads to a motor to see you do it mm-hmm. and talk about it and just confirm that he's doing it right is is priceless for people. So I hope people appreciate all the extra effort you've done just on the sharing of information, not the fact that, oh, well, I have a cam that's gonna work, or I have a cylinder head port that's gonna work, or here's what I'm gonna sell you, but it's more like, here's how all this works, here's why we did it this way, here's the advantage of why, you know, the camshaft's set up this way, things like that. So I I just wanted to say, I really appreciate that because, you know, even though we're friends and I can call you, a lot of times I just go watch one of Evan's videos because I'm like, oh, Brian already talked about that. I'm not even gonna bother. I'm just gonna go watch his video. So, you know, the YouTube video is a good way to pull it all together, but even, the next step beyond that is like a very comprehensive reference, you know, for that. And there's nobody more qualified to do that than you because you are involved in designing Mm. the engine or at least, you know, overseeing it, managing, you know, not every individual part, but the whole thing. And then now you've taken it to the next level. Like there's almost nobody on the planet that's done that on almost any engine platform. So, you know, that's, that's just amazing to me. Um, is there anything you wanted to touch on before we wrap things up? I think we got we covered quite a bit. Yeah, no, I, nothing else I can think of. We talked a lot, a lot from you know how the Fox Body Mustang is still here to Godzillas and Coyotes and Cobra Jets. Uh, you know, lots of cool stuff. So I really appreciate you having me on and being able to chat about the stuff. Awesome. Thanks for coming.